Guy. Uh, before I go ahead to introduce myself, I would also want to state that you are being recorded for privacy reasons. I'm obligated to tell you that. And the recording is just so that you can have access to this video when this class is done, because I'm going to be, you know, going through like a high level overview of the course. There are several things I'm going to be talking about today that you would probably want to go back to. I understand some of you have already registered for my intensive classes and for people that have registered for the intensive classes who are still going to meet and, you know, over the next five, six weeks, we're still going to meet and talk about some other details that we won't be able to get into today. But for those that won't be attending the intensive classes, you can always return to this video on YouTube. So this video is going to be made available on YouTube and a link can also be sent to you. So by way of introduction, my name is Kenny Okola. I'm an internationally trained lawyer like yourself. I did my legal training in Nigeria before I moved to Canada several years ago. Uh, right now, I'm a corporate securities lawyer. That's what I've been doing since I was called to the Canadian bar. Interestingly, I picked my uh, uh, I picked the interest in administrative law while I was studying for the NCA exams like yourself. It was the toughest exam for me. And I thought to myself that it can't really be that tough. So that got me interested and I started looking into it more, started reading more text, started looking at articles. And I wish I had the knowledge I have today as at the time I was writing the exams. Anyways, um, I also tutored this same course at a community college in Calgary, our brother year. The college, for anyone that lives in Calgary or Edmonton or surrounding areas, you probably know the college called Bow Valley College. So there's a partnership with the Alberta government with the Directions for Immigrants in Trades and Professions. So I tutored this same course under that same uh, program. For anyone that has any other questions regarding you know, my professional journey, feel free to email me at Kenny at ncaguides.com. All right, so we're just going to kickstart uh, discussions on admin law. So because we have a lot to discuss and I must uh, give you guys a bit of a disclaimer. We are not going to cover everything in admin law today, but what I will try as much as possible to do is I will give you a big picture overview so that if you haven't studied at all, you will be hungry to go and study after this class like you the desire to want to study will come on you after this class that's the major uh objective of this class so i assume everyone has the um updated syllabus or a copy of the canadian administrative law syllabus that you are studying with that's the number one thing you need and i think for people that have studied or that have written one or two exams you probably don't need to be reminded that this is what you should be doing but if you are studying for your first exams then you need to go get this on the nca's website now i understand that a lot of us have different materials that we are studying with which is absolutely fine. There are so many authors out there. We, we do have a couple of materials on our own website too. So for anyone that is interested in um, snagging one material or the other, you can definitely go to our website, www.ncaguides.com, I believe, and go to like our study materials tab or study notes or NCA notes, one of those three names, and you can buy any materials, whether with a credit card, interact transfer, depending on where you are. But irrespective of whatever materials you purchase, please ensure that you are studying with the syllabus. Ensure that whatever, whatever the syllabus says, you are able to come or whatever the material says you're able to confirm it from the syllabus if there is a conflict with whatever material you're studying with and the syllabus the syllabus prevail now i will ask for a volunteer to help us read this chapter one because i think this chapter one sort of helps put in context what we are doing today now there are several chapters in the syllabus this is setting the stage there's a chapter on uh, sources of procedural obligations, procedural obligation triggers, uh, procedural obligation triggers legislative decisions and emergencies, charter and bill of rights, the constitutional duty to consult, and whatnot, whatnot. However, I think the most relevant part to the big picture perspective is this chapter one setting the stage. So I'll get a volunteer to read chapter one for us, and then 
I will proceed to unpack it and let us really understand the nature of this course that we all want to sit for the exam. So who wants to volunteer to read chapter one for us? Okay, setting the stage. One of the most important things to understand in studying administrative law is the big picture. A failure to do so may result in candidates being lost in extraneous details. The critical idea at the core of administrative law is this. It is the body of law that governs how people exercising power pursuant to a delegation of power in a statute or occasionally the lawyer prerogative go about their business. In most cases, the people who have this form of power, again, typically given to them by a, state, by a statute are members of the executive branch of government. Although often at some arm's length from it. In our system, based on the rule of law, we want to make sure that people with this power exercise it properly. Almost all of the administrative law is about deciding what we may, what we mean by properly. Chapter one provides an excellent overview of why administrative law matters and also the core elements of administrative law doctrine. In this syllabus, we divide the discipline into three parts. One, procedural fairness, or more generally, gen procedural expectations that administrative decision makers must meet. Two, substantive constraints, or more generally, the sorts of substantive errors deciding the merits of a matter that administrative decision makers must avoid. And three, how to challenge administrative decisions and remedies on judicial review, or more generally, the relief available to a person who wishes to challenge an administrative decision and the procedure to be followed in seeking the relief or this relief. One word of warning. I think this is Page 21 to 22 outlines a high level description of grounds of judicial review in administrative law. It is correct in a general sense, but it is very much at the conceptual categorization. The actual way in which courts apply grounds of review is different. Do not apply the principles on page 21 to 22 to an exam question. You need to be guided by the more specific tests that follow in materials incorporated by this syllabus. The big picture perspective here is saying administrative law is essentially deciding what we mean by properly. Now, I would like to try and explain this as if we are not lawyers, and then we'll now discuss it as if or as though we are lawyers. Now, we understand that there are three um arms of governments that are supposed to be separate but in canada we know they are not exactly that separate like the other countries that practice the same type of governmental system so we've got the executive we've got the judiciary we've got the legislative arm of governments now we know the legislative arm of governments make the laws they make laws and then the executive enforce those laws then the judiciary do what? They interpret the laws. Now, the bulk of what we're gonna be discussing really deals with the interaction between the three of them. Administrative agencies are agencies that have been set up by law to address certain issues. Now, emphasis is set up by law. That is the lawmakers made a law to establish those admin agencies. That's the very first step of that process. Lawmakers say, oh, here is a bill to, uh, to establish the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada, IROC. Now, IROC used to be an admin agency. They've merged with MFDA and they are now called SRO. But let's assume they are still in existence. So or we can use the Immigration Refugees Board, IRB, as an example. So a law to establish the IRB. The lawmakers make that law. Now, the moment that law or that bill is passed into law, the admin agency comes into existence. They become an entity. Where the challenge starts from, where the challenge starts from is when 
the admin agency now starts to exercise the powers that the law that establishes them has given to them. And more often than not, admin agencies are always saddled with the powers of deciding the rights and the interest and the privileges of individuals, you and I. I call it RIP, rights, interest, and privileges. Now, there used to be a distinction between those three, but not anymore. So you don't need to worry about that. So a lawmaker makes a law to establish an admin agency, and then they give them the power to determine the rights, interests, and privileges of people. What do we mean by that? So if a lawmaker established the IRB, and they say the IRB now has the authority to determine the rights, interests, and privileges of people that are applying to Canada to come to Canada either, either, either as, a uh, as a student or as a permanent resident. The IRB can decide to refuse such application. That is essentially determining or to, or to determine the rights and interests and privileges of that applicant. Now, what does the judiciary do? So let's leave that aside for a minute. What does the judiciary do? What is the nature of judicial work in any country? They interpret laws. And in interpreting laws, the judiciary, the courts, they also do what? They also determine the rights and interests and privileges of people. So if I decide to sue someone to court today, all I'm essentially asking the court to do is what? Can you help us determine who is right and who is wrong? Whether it be a contractual matter, whether it be a uh, criminal matter, whether it be a civil matter or a tort matter, essentially you're trying to get somebody who has been saddled with the authority to say, the plaintiff, you're right or you're wrong, the defendant, you're right or you're wrong, or whatever name of parties that they decide to assign in that court. Now, what the judiciary has come to find is that these admin agencies are now exercising powers that are similar to courts. That is, the courts are being asked to determine what is right. That is, determine the rights, interests, and privileges of applicants and litigants that come before them. And these admin agencies that have been set up by law, by the legislature, are also determining the rights and interests and privileges of people. Now, I would also like to juggle our memory, sort of refresh our memory on the concept of separation of powers. And I think this is also going to help us understand the big picture overview. I want to believe, except for anyone that maybe studied uh, in civil law jurisdiction, because I didn't do, I wasn't, I was, I didn't study in a civil law jurisdiction, so I'm not sure whether that was covered. But I assume everyone that studied in a common law jurisdiction would have, at one point in time or the other, encountered the concept of separation of powers, which essentially says that the executive arm and the legislative arm and the judicial arm they should be separate, and none of them should exercise each other's authority or powers. Which is why only the lawmakers can make laws. Only the executive can enforce the laws. Only the judiciary can interpret the laws. Now, what the judiciary have seen now with the, with the, with the advent of administrative entities is that admin entities are now interpreting laws, which is supposed to be the responsibility of the judiciary. And that is where the problem starts from. Now, the courts are now responding, decided to respond to that by saying, okay, fine lawmakers have decided to encroach on our authority as the only or as the sole interpreters of laws fine if you establish entities to do the same thing that we are doing already then they have to do it exactly the way we would have done it and that is what gave birth to the idea of judicial review that is, whatever the decision of an administrative decision maker, the courts have an inherent right to review such decisions on the authority of the rule of law. And that was the decision in AG of Quebec versus Cravia. Now, we're going to come back to that. I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves. So let's go into a few definitions and then we build on that. So now, Barron's Canadian Law Dictionary defines admin law as those rules of law that concerns the exercise of the powers and privileges of the executive branch of government. It is mostly concerned with the actions and decisions pursuant to the powers given to the executive by the parliament or and provincial legislatures. I'm going to exp uh, explain this. Now, this is saying powers given to the executive by the parliament. Now, the reason for that statement is that despite the fact that the lawmakers are the ones that make the law, to create an admin agency, 
admin agencies are still considered to be part of the executive arm. Does that make sense? So you potentially see this in your notes where you see the parliament giving powers to the executive. So we're not, th we're not talking about the executive as in the prime minister or the ministers or whatever now. They are referring to admin agencies because admin agencies, despite the fact that the creation of law, they are still considered as part of the executive arm of government or operating within an arm's length of the executive arm of government. Now, administrative law is particularly concerned about the rules that exist to control administrative tribunals, bodies and commissions and administrative actors or actions in its broader sense. Now, who does this law apply? The executive branch. Again, going back to the explanation that admin agencies are deemed to be a part of the executive arm of government. Now, what does the exercise of the, what, what, what does this cause really concern? The exercise of power. That is how those admin agencies are exercising the powers that has been granted to them by law. And who is going to review that exercise of power? The courts, the judiciary. Now, where does that power come from? Again, the lawmakers grant them that power, that those powers. And one thing I one distinction I want to make right now, because I'm going to be using this throughout our conversation today and also over the next couple of weeks for anyone that is going to be part of our classes. When I say parliament, I mean the federal legislative body. And when I say provincial legislatures, then I mean the legislative assembly of the different provinces. So I just want to I want you guys to understand that and you potentially will maybe see that in your exams. So you want to understand and you will you will you will soon discover why you need to understand the distinction because there are laws that are made by a legislative assembly of a province cannot bind an administrative tribunal that was created by a federal law. We're going to get to that subsequently. Now, what does admin law do? It governs and controls these bodies. Another definition that we see here from David Jones says admin law deals with legal limitations on the actions of government officials and the remedies which are available to anyone affected by a transgression of these limits. So once these decision makers, these administrative entities have made a decision that has affected an individual and the individual isn't entirely satisfied or happy with that decision, they can now go to the law court and say, can you please review this decision to be sure that this decision is a good one? Then the next step is for the court to now grant a remedy to that applicant saying, oh, you're not happy, here's a remedy. And there are several types of remedies which we're also going to get to by the, you know, as, as this class progresses. I'm going to come back to this. I don't think we need to talk about that yet. So now the next thing we should be asking ourselves now is the syllabus says uh, admin law can now be, uh, uh, the discipline can be divided into three parts. I like to come back to the syllabus every now and then for a bit of a sanity check. So the syllabus can be, uh, the discipline can be divided into three parts. One, procedural fairness. The second part is substantive constraints. And I'm going to explain. And the last part is how you challenge those decisions and the remedies. And we can say the fourth part is remedies that you get after you challenge the decisions. Now, what does what role does this procedural fairness, substantive constraints, what role do they play in the entire discourse of admin law? So again, let's go back to the explanation I offered earlier. The IRB as an admin agency was established by law and they've been established to determine the rights, interests and privileges of anyone that is applying to Canada for any sort of visa, right? So say, for example, they then apply and the person's visa was not approved. What they've just done is they've just decided the rights and interests and privileges of that visa applicant. So if that visa applicant is not happy, what does what options would that person have? The number one option is to go to court for judicial review. Now, when you go to court, what will the court do? How will the court review the decision? The process of reviewing that decision is judicial review, but the, the review itself is going to be broken down into two parts. The first part is procedural fairness review. 
And the second part is the review of the substantive issues. What does procedural fairness review, what does it entail? Procedural fairness review essentially means the review of the procedures that the admin body followed or employed or adopted or used in arriving at their decision. And that is what we call procedural fairness. That is, those procedures were they fair to the applicant? That is one leg of the review. Or we can say the 50% of the review that the court is going to undertake. The second leg of that review is to review the substantive issues. Now, review of substantive issues has nothing to do with procedure. This has to do with the substance of the decision itself. And I'm going to use myself as an example so that you get this. And if you have seen any of my videos before, you've probably heard this example so many times. About 11, 12 years ago, I think, maybe I think it was around 12 years ago, I was, I applied, you know, I got admission to study uh, for LLM into Canada. And then I applied to come to Canada to come study. And I had paid the tuition and my visa was denied. My study visa was denied. And guess what the reason for the denial by the immigration officer was? They said they don't believe I can pay the tuition. Now, the document or the package, the application package that I submitted included the receipt for the tuition fully paid. I think the tuition was probably, I don't know, was, it was a bit cheap then. Maybe it was 27 or 30,000. I can't remember. So it, it included the receipt for the full tuition already paid. Now, I, now I, I then ran into some immigration lawyers who were practicing in Ottawa at the time. And I retained their services because, of course, I wasn't in Canada. So I retained their services to appeal to the federal courts. And we're going to get to when we, as, as you know, when we get to like the uh, end of this conversation, we're going to discuss where you can challenge a matter like uh, an admin judicial review, which particular court you go to and what determines what court you go to. So these guys reviewed, uh, they filed for an application for judicial review on my behalf. I was still back in my country. I filled out the application document and, you know, couriered them over. And they, you know, they applied to the federal courts. And, you know, what the federal court did was the federal court will now consider the procedure that that immigration officer, because the refusal of that study visa application is essentially determining my rights and my interests and my privileges, right? So that decision, and that's a decision. So that decision will now be reviewed or was reviewed by the federal court on two grounds. The first ground is to consider what procedure the immigration officer followed before arriving at the decision that I can't afford to pay the tuition. So what are those procedures? So what do we mean by procedures? To understand procedures, again, we have to go back to the court. Remember, what the court is trying to ensure is that admin decision makers are doing things exactly the way the court will do them, or at least something close. Because courts may be a bit more, courts may be more sophistic, uh, sophisticated in the sense that, you know, they may be able to do like more formal processes and admin agencies are quasi-judicial and they may not be required to do, you know, be strictly formal in their approach. But the essence must still remain. And when we say the essence, what do we mean? If you go to a typical court and you want to be, you want to start like a process, a litigation, or, or you want to, you, you want to file a lawsuit, how do you start? you have to prepare all your documentation in some jurisdiction you are you know you are expected to front load so you file everything your originating motions depending on what kind of uh, uh motion you're filing and then when that is done you get the court belief to go and serve it on the other party right you get the court belief to serve it on the other party except it's an ex parte application which only you will be heard. But if it's a uh, contested application, you get the court belief to serve the other party and the court belief or you know, whoever the service person is, serves the party and comes back to court with proof of service. If they are unable to serve the other party, what do they do? They essentially just, um, they come back and then they get an order of substituted service to go and serve that particular person, maybe posting it at their entrance or putting it on a newspaper or whatever. So why is the court doing that? Because they want to follow procedure. 
Act. They want to ensure that they are fair in those procedures. That is, if someone is being sued, they should know they are being sued. That is number one procedural fairness obligation notice. Now, after that is done and the proceedings have started, the hearing has started or the trial has started, what, how do they start? Everyone is expected to do some sort of presentation. Whether it's going to be opening statements, opening arguments, there will be examination of witnesses. That's another procedural fairness obligation. You, if, you, if the witness is yours, you conduct what, we, what they call examination in chief. Right. If the witness is in yours, you conduct a cross examination and then on and on and on and on. And then the court will now give its own decision. Those are procedures that courts will employ to ensure that they follow the right procedures and they are fair in those procedures. So the court will now review an admin decision, just like my decision that was before the federal courts and ask the judicial officer or the immigration officer, what procedures did you follow? before you decided that these applicants cannot pay their tuition. Did you review all the documentation that they sent in? And even if you had that hunch that they couldn't pay, did you send a request for supplemental information to them, which is probably what is happening these days for anyone that has applied for any sort of visa recently to come to Canada. If a document is missing, they'll probably request for supplemental information. They weren't doing that before. So the court we ask, did you request for a supplemental information to confirm that they really couldn't pay? Because even if the document is missing, you should give them an opportunity to clarify. You shouldn't just make that decision and say, well, it's not there, you can't pay. But then it's even there. Now, so that's one ground, procedural fairness review. So the court is going to consider all those procedures. Now, the second ground is the substantive constraints. So now the court is not going to ask whether they gave me the notice or gave me the right to be heard or whether they gave me the right to cross-examine or I had a right to counsel or there was no bias. The court won't be bothered about that when they get to the substantive issues review. For the substantive issues, the court wants to consider the decision itself. That is, does the decision itself make any sense? Can we say this decision itself is a decision that is reasonable, is intelligible? Now, to do that, the only way the court can conduct such a review is to review it by a standard. That is, they will need a standard to determine if a decision is a bad decision. You can't just say, oh, this decision is a bad decision because I said so. It doesn't work that way. You have to be able to say, the reason why this decision is bad is because they didn't do this and this. Just like in procedural fairness, the reason why they will say a decision is not procedurally fair is because they didn't follow the procedures that a typical court will follow by, for example, providing notice, providing the right to counsel, allowing the applicants an oral opportunity to be orally heard, and things like that. Now, that now leads to what we call the standard of review. So, for example, if I say Roti Me on my screen, for example, now is a bad student. How did I come to that conclusion that Roti Me is a bad student? Or Ineke is a good student. How did I come to that conclusion? I must have given them an examination first, right? And maybe one of them passed and one of them didn't pass. Then that examination is the standard of review. That examination would have been the standard that I used to review or to judge who the good student is and who the bad student is. So the same standard of review is required under the substantive issues review by the court for the court to understand whether a decision is a good decision or a bad decision. Now we have different standards of review, but then still on the big picture perspective. So I don't want to go into that yet. I'm going to come back. Now the final part is how to challenge these admin decisions. Where do you go to? How do you start the process? What courts are you gonna go? How do you determine the court that should have the jurisdiction to entertain such matters? And then what are the remedies? Let's try and break it down from procedural fairness. I'm gonna be sharing a chart with you guys. Uh, and again, so a, a couple of charts rather. What I've just explained is what you can see on your screen, the big picture overview, admin law, the process of ensuring that admin agencies stick to 
the parameters of their authority and not do anything outside of the authority that has been granted to them by the lawmakers and they follow the right procedures you know when they're exercising those you know that particular authority that has been granted to them and if they go out of that if they exceed the authorities or they, they they exercise it in a way that is inconsistent with the grant of the authority, then you can go to court for judicial review. Now, I'm using the word court loosely because as you will soon come to find, in for, especially for anyone that has studied far, you realize that there are some times that judicial review may not necessarily be in a court. It may be is another admin agency that has the authority to review that lower admin agency. So I'm just using courts generally. Sometimes it may be to a higher agency and not necessarily a court. You will soon understand that subsequently. Now, the process of conducting the judicial review, again, like I mentioned earlier, it's going to be done either on procedural grounds or substantive grounds. And then when the court has you know, come to its decision, either on the two grounds, then remedies uh remedies will be granted and by the way i didn't give you guys a conclusion i did win the case at the federal court so just in case you're wondering i i shouldn't leave you hanging all right so let's go into procedural fairness what does procedural fairness mean how do we conduct procedural fairness now the chart before you right now and i hope everyone is paying attention because well you can always go back to the video but i do hope you're paying attention especially if you don't plan to be in my class this is an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the class now for procedural fairness uh to conduct procedural fairness we need to uh consider first the sources of that procedural fairness which is why I have this breakdown here that I call the STTC approach, sources, triggers, threshold, and contents. And I'm gonna explain exactly what they mean. So the sources are the sources of the procedural fairness obligation. Remember, if I, have, if I go to the federal courts because my study visa was refused, and I have gone to the court saying, I wanted to review the refusal first on procedural fairness grounds and second on substantive grounds so now we are starting with the procedural fairness grounds review now the next thing the court we ask is oh okay you want us to you want us to review the decision for procedural fairness all right what are the procedures that you were denied that's the next question that your lawyer is going to have to answer what are the procedures that you were denied or what are the procedures that you were granted that you think were not fair? After you've answered that question, the next thing the court is going to ask you, of course, it's not going to be a Q&A, but it's part of the consideration when you're doing your submission, making your submission. The next thing the court will expect from you is that now that you have identified the procedures that were not fair. So an example of a procedure that could not be fair is maybe you were not given notice. Maybe you were not granted the right to counsel. Maybe you were not granted oral hearing. Maybe the, the admin agency was biased. So those are procedures that were not fair. You've identified four of them. So the next thing you now need to determine is, as the next thing the court will ask you is, okay, these procedures were not fair and they are missing. The, but were you entitled to them? Because you cannot say someone was not fair to you if you were not entitled to that fairness. You can't put something on nothing, right? Rings a bell. So you cannot claim that someone was not fair to you if you were not entitled to the fairness. So for example, someone could say, oh, Kenny, why didn't you... Um, so this class is essentially about two to three hours, right? So someone can say, oh, Kenny, why didn't you make this class six hours? That's not fair. So the next question is, is the person entitled to a six hour class? Right? So you cannot just say, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't fair. Now, to now establish that you were entitled to that fairness, you need to now produce before the court the sources that granted or that guaranteed those fairness procedures, but the admin decision maker did not follow them, which is what leads to the conversation on sources of procedural fairness. So those sources, are uh, le legislations, laws that have 
codified your right to certain procedures that the admin agencies was or were expected to have adopted and followed, but they did not. So if you don't find the right that you were denied in any of those sources or any, any one of the, uh, uh, the source, then you can't claim that you were deprived or denied of that right. So what are these sources of procedural fairness obligation? The number one source is the enabling law that established that decision maker itself. Remember I said admin agencies are creations of law. They are creations of statute. They didn't just arrive like the big bang, boom, and everything now became, you know, came into existence. They were established by law. Even if the big bang is right anyways, they were established by law. So which means though the lawmakers that made the law that established them would have also, you know, inserted certain procedural fairness obligations for the people they will exercise the authority over. So you will see the reference to that in the syllabus on your textbook as enabling statute. So essentially what that means is that the statute that enabled the decision maker. Now, the second source of procedural fairness obligation are what we call general procedural statutes or statutes of general procedures, whatever you have in your notes or your textbook. What does this mean? So these general procedural statutes are procedural laws that have been enacted by certain provinces. And as of the last time I checked, we only have, I think, four or five of them in existence. So here, here they are. The first one is the SPPA in Ontario, the Statutory Powers and Procedures Act in Ontario. And the second one is the one in Alberta, that's the APJA, Alberta's Administrative Procedures and Jurisdiction Act. The third one is the Quebec's AT, uh, Act Respecting Admin Justice. And the fourth one is the BC's ATA, Administrative Tribunals Act. And of course, we have some other procedural codes and laws like the Ontario's Human Rights Code, which also provides you know, for certain similar provisions to the SPPA. But essentially, these four are the provinces that have general procedural laws. So the provinces are Ontario, Alberta, Quebec, and BC. Now, how to apply this? General procedural laws is an entire class in itself, but I'll try and summarize it as soon as as much as I can. So, for general procedural laws, if your decision maker was not created by a law that was made by any of these provinces, then this will not apply to them, because you cannot apply a law that was made in Ontario to a decision maker that was created in Prince Edward Island. So, which means if your decision maker was created in Ontario, then this can apply to them. If your decision maker was created or made by a law of the Alberta's Legislative Assembly, then this law applies to them. If your decision maker was created by an act of, of the Quebec Legislative Assembly, then this procedural law will apply to them. And if your decision maker was created by the BC Legislative Assembly, this will apply to them. So, they don't apply outside of that parameters. So that's the general procedural statute. Now, the next one is the common law. So the common law is not essentially a codified statute, so to speak. It's just a body of laws, precedents, judge-made laws. I understand that for anyone that, that studied in the common law jurisdiction, you understand, you probably remember when the principles of equity and common law were fused together by the Judicature Act of, was it 1872 or 1873 now? And that's the common law we are referring to here. That is judge-made laws, judicial precedents, principles that the courts have come up with based on case laws. And those principles, they form a body of common law that can also guarantee certain procedural fairness rights. For example, there was a case of Cannes versus University of Ottawa. And in that case, it was about oral, um, it was about oral hearing. And prior to that case, oral hearing wasn't an automatic right. But the case established that if credibility is an issue, then oral hearing must be granted. 
Now, in that case, Miss Khan, and anyone that has studied will probably know that case. In that case, Miss Khan is a law student. She was, I think she was a law student in the University of Ottawa. She wrote the final bar exams and she, um, trying to remember what happened in that case, she got an extra booklet. You know, that extra booklet story reminds me of when I was writing my NCA exams. Then it was in person and someone was sitting next to me and they sort of space you out to the extent that even if you try and whisper, the next person can't hear you. So the person that was sitting next to me, you know, she went to request for an extra booklet. And yeah, I was. I was like, what is she writing? Like, are we answering the same exam question? Like, how is, how is it that she needs extra booklet? Of course I passed. But, you know, that's what happens in a physical examination or as in as against just sitting behind a computer in your own home office and writing your exam no pressure no one is you know bringing an extra textbook to class or whatever so miss khan got an extra booklet in uh you know during the exams but she forgot to fasten that extra booklet to the other two now she didn't pass the by exams or the final exams in school then she decided to appeal the decision, the, the failure decision to whatever authority within the university. And the university said, oh, no, you didn't pass, blah, 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 because we marked your scripts and all that. So when they got to court, she claimed that there was a third booklet that wasn't considered. And the court said, so the court asked expert witnesses from the school side that if you had considered this third booklet, would she have passed? And they said, yes, she probably would have passed because her scores, her, her marks were close to the pass grade, passing grade. So which means the court was not able to now sort of decipher that the real issue here is not whether or not she would have passed. The real issue here is whether or not she's telling the truth about the existence of a thought booklet. So the court was able to narrow that down to an issue of credibility. That is, if you say the third booklet doesn't exist, that is, it means Miss Khan is lying. If you say the third booklet exists, it means she's telling the truth, which touches on her credibility. And the court said, well, if credibility is an issue, you should have heard her in person. You should have allowed her to explain how the third booklet exists and where they could have found it. You shouldn't have made it a written hearing where you don't see the applicant and you decide based on written submissions. And based on that case law, we got an additional procedural fairness obligation that when credibility is an issue, oral hearing should be granted. So that's how common law can also provide procedural fairness. Now, the next source of procedural fairness obligation is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom. So the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom was, for anyone that have studied constitutional law or written the exams, you probably don't need any introduction to this, but if this is your first time hearing about the Charter, the Charter was the, uh, I think it was the second attempt. I hope I'm not wrong. I, the Bill of Rights came first, but then the Charter was the subsequent attempt to codify human rights, federal, federal national human rights legislation across Canada. The Bill of Rights failed because they made it a standalone law. It's still in existence, but they made it a standalone law. And because of that, it wasn't adopted by the provinces. It's just a federal law for all intents and purposes. But the Charter succeeded because they added it or they included it in the Constitution. So for all intents and purposes, it's part of the Constitution. In fact, it's a constitutional document, which automatically makes it applicable across the whole of Canada. And the Charter, we, for the Charter, we are only concerned about Section 7. And the triggers there are life, liberty, and security. For the Bill of Rights, the triggers are Section 1A and Section 2E. And of course, another source of procedural fairness rights is the Constitution Act of 1982. And the reason why I have this in orange is because this applies to indigenous people. Now, let's go back. So trying to recap, sources enabling law of the decision maker general procedural statutes of the re respective provinces that have enacted them, the principles of common law, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution Act of 1982. So now, when we, so for every source that you are claiming has guaranteed you procedural fairness, you have to also prove that that source has been triggered. That is the obligation of procedural fairness has been triggered for it to apply. So how do you trigger the procedural fairness obligation in a specific source? 
when it comes to the statute, the syllabus says the trigger is in the statute. Let's go back to the syllabus. I'm, I'm trying to rush because of time, but let's go back to the syllabus so um, you guys don't think I'm making this up. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, OK, so triggers. Now that you understand that procedural obligations come from a number of different sources, you need to understand which of these procedural rules apply where applies where we call this trigger or threshold where where is a given procedural obligation triggered where procedural rules come from legislation typically but not always the legislation that gives the decision makers or powers in the first place the answer to the trigger question is in the legislation itself so i'm just going to go back i'll come back to the syllabus again so when it comes to the enabling statute the trigger is in that statute what does that mean it means that whatever whatever initiated that re relationship with the applicants that made that applicant subject to the jurisdiction of that decision maker, that is the trigger factor. And I'll give I'll, I'll give you guys a working example. So I'll go back to my visa application. When I was applying for my visa, why did I send it to the IRCC? I think it was called CIC then, I don't know. Maybe it was IRCC, I'm not sure. Why did I send it to the IRCC? Why didn't I send it to the Law Society? Why didn't I send my visa application to the NCA? Why didn't I send my visa application to the World Bank? Why didn't I send it to the IROC or the Ontario Parking Authority? I sent it to them because the enabling legislation gave them the jurisdiction and the authority to decide visa applications. The section of their law that gave them that authority initiated our relationship, and that is the trigger in that statute. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so that's the trigger in that statute. Very, very important. Okay. Um, general procedural statute. So let's go back to the syllabus again. Um, the syllabus now says, so too with general statutes about procedure, they contain their own triggers. So you need to be careful to read that legislation if it applies to your decision maker. General procedural statutes are also statutes. They are statutory provisions. It's a law. So the same principle that applies to an enabling statute in terms of the trigger also applies to a general procedural statute in the sense that ask yourself what triggers the application of that general procedural statute to your case, to your situation as an applicant who has been denied or deprived certain procedural benefits? That is also the answer to the trigger question. So I think for these two sources, because they are both statutory provisions or statutory uh, documents, they are both laws, the same principles on identifying the trigger applies to both of them. And this is probably going to make more sense to you after you've studied. But for the common law and the rest of the sources, their triggers are much more easier to identify. And I'll start with the common law. Well, maybe not necessarily easy, but we know something we can, that we can point at. So I'll start with the common law. The triggers, the common law has two triggers. The first trigger is what we call the night three pronged test. I call it KTP in my chart. And the second trigger is what we call the concept of legitimate expectation. So let's see what the syllabus says about that. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Also, realize that even though, oh, no, we don't need that. Yeah, so we can make more general observations about other sources of procedural obligations. The readings focus in particular on the trigger for common law for common law procedural fairness. Basically, there are two triggers. What we call the Knight versus Indian Ed three-prong trigger, and also a concept known as legitimate expectation. So the Knight three-prong trigger was developed from a case called the Knight versus Indian Ed. And uh, do we have time? Yeah, let's go through the case. So in that case, what happened in the case of Knight versus Indian Ed was there was an applicant or where is it? Yeah. So in Knight versus Indian Ed, there was an applicant that was, uh, let me just take this off the screen so you guys can pay attention to me for a minute. So there was an applicant that was uh, was a public, was, was an employee in public service. That's essentially what happened. And it was, it was let go 
And then he decided to appeal the decision to let him go saying, well, I'm an employee in public service. My employer was a creation of statute. Definitely they are an admin agency and they should have afforded me procedural fairness. And of course, in the first instance, the court agreed with him. But then subsequently, in the case of Donsmia, the court rejected that approach, saying, wait, administrative law doesn't deal with an employee-employer relationship. Administrative law essentially deals with an individual that doesn't have a choice, but had to subject to the authority of an admin agency simply because the law gave that admin agency the right to determine their rights, interests, and privileges. But an employee-employer relationship is different because you didn't submit because the law says you should submit to that jurisdiction or that authority. You submitted by way of contract because they gave you an offer, you liked the offer, you saw the benefit, and you signed an employment contract. That is not administrative law at all. And the court, however, now said, well, despite the fact that we are saying that will not apply, there may still be three exceptions where if it's still an employee-employer relationship, this may still apply. And those three exceptions are, number one, um, I should have that somewhere here. So number one, where the public law of duty or fairness may still, may still apply where the employee is not, number one, protected by a contract of employment. And this was the subject. This right here was the subject of the admin law exams two or three diets ago, where they, uh, I think, you know, Again, we're not, we're not supposed to discuss the content of an NCA exams in any class, but my understanding was that most people did not understand what they were supposed to do in that particular instance because they were like, oh, but it, it protected an employee. Sorry, it was an employee-employer relationship, but it was the case of a judge. And a judge is not protected by a contract of employment. So if you didn't understand that exception, you would definitely have been confused in the exams. So an exception is where that public, public employee isn't protected by a contract of employment, and also where an office order is subject to summary dismissal, and finally where a duty of fairness flows by necessary implication from the statutory power that governs the employment relationship. So that's essentially what happened in the uh, Knight case. And as a result of that case, the court now came up with a three-prong test. So that three-prong test is what will help an applicant determine whether the common law will be applicable to them as a procedural fairness source. Remember, we are still on sources of procedural fairness obligation, and now we are on common law. And we are trying to determine when the common law is triggered. And we also said that the common law can be triggered in two instances. Instance number one is the night three prong trigger. Instance number two is the concept of legitimate expectation. So the night three prong trigger, the background is what I just provided a few minutes ago, which is that if those three prong tests can apply to you, then the common law has been triggered. Now, the interesting thing about the three prong test is that all every single one of that test must apply to you. So it's not the case that oh, two applies, one doesn't apply. All three must apply. And let's look at the three prong test. What does it say? Number one part of the three prong test has to do with the nature of the decision. Number two has to do with the relationship existing between that admin body and the individual. And number three has to do with the effect of the decision on the individual's rights, interests, and privileges. So let's break them down. Nature of the decision. So for this nature of the decision factor, the court is concerned with two things. Number one, whether the decision is a preliminary decision or a final decision. Number two, whether the decision is a legislative decision or an administrative decision. So when it comes to analyzing this nature of the decision factor, which is the first factor, if your decision is a legislative decision, legislative decisions don't attract procedural fairness. Why? I expect somebody to ask me why, <laughs> you know, not don't, don't just accept it because I said it. Why is it that legislative decisions don't, act, you know, don't attract procedural fairness? Because who wants to tell me why? Who wants to, who wants to try? Anybody? <laughs> 
anybody, and I have a gift for whoever gets it right. There's a gift. Yeah, there, there are incentives for attending a free class. Because you can't fetter the jurisdiction of parliament, basically. Close. You, you're, you're, on, you're on track, but that's not exactly why. You're on track. I mean, just in case I give you the answer, you feel strongly about, you know, so, but you're on track. It's just, I, I need you to eat the nail on the head. Who's I? It's okay if you don't know it. I didn't call you to this class to come and answer questions. But um, the reason why legislative decisions are not subject to procedural fairness is they are still similar to what Ineke said. They are still considered act of the legislative arm of government. And in the legislative process, procedural fairness is not considered. That is, whenever the lawmakers are making law, they don't usually ask people that, oh, do you like the law before we pass it to bill, uh, pass the bill into a law? No, they don't. They will pass the bill into law. In fact, they don't have an obligation to make good laws. Do you guys know that? The lawmakers don't have an obligation to make good laws. As a matter of fact, they can make retroactive laws except for criminal laws. So they can come out today and say, we are making this law and we are making it retroactive for the last 10, 20 years. And then everybody's in trouble. Except for criminal laws. So that's how powerful the lawmakers are, which is why I said you're on track, because it's about fettering their jurisdiction, so to speak. Now, when a decision maker is now exercising a legislative power, it is considered to be a delegation. That is, the lawmakers made a law that established that decision maker. So now when the lawmakers made that law on the higher level, establishing the decision maker, they granted two kinds of powers to that decision maker. The first kind of power they granted was administrative powers. The second kind of power they usually grant are legislative powers. So now when we say legislative powers, we don't mean they will go and make laws in the stead of the lawmakers, you know, at the assembly or parliament or whatever. No, but they grant them like delegated legislative powers to make laws that will affect their own institution. So the IRB, for example, can make guidelines that will make the process of visa applications easy without going back to the lawmakers to say, oh, can you make us a guideline? We know you've made the bill that passed us into law, but can you make us like two, three guidelines for people that are applying for study visa? So for example, the IRCC may decide to say, you know, we want to create a new visa pathway for skilled trade workers. They don't need to go back to the parliaments if they already have that authority in their law to make that law. They will just simply just make a guideline or make a regulation pursuant to the master law that gave them that delegated legislative powers. Now, when the IRCC, or sorry, when the IRB is now ex exercising that delegated legislative powers, they don't owe the applicants procedural fairness. So, which is why this nature of the decision needs you to identify whether the decision they've made is a legislative one or an administrative one. Because if it's an administrative decision, then it triggers procedural fairness. But if it's a legislative decision, it does not trigger procedural fairness. So that's 1A. 1B, preliminary versus final decision. Preliminary decisions generally are not final decisions, right? So why should you be saying a decision is not fair to you if it's not final? It's like going to inspect somebody that is, um, you know, baking a cake for you and you're saying, oh, this cake doesn't look good. You're still baking it. So if a decision is preliminary, you cannot go to court and say, oh, this decision is not good, except in one instance only, buyers. You are encouraged to run to court as soon as possible when it comes to buyers, because you don't want buyers to cascade into a bad decision before you go to, go to court to address it. But other than that, a preliminary decision does not attract procedural fairness. But final decisions do, because they are now final. Now, in discussing preliminary versus final decision, there is a very important factor. There's a very important thing that you need to know, which is the concept of investigations and recommendations. You would have seen it in your notes, investigations and recommendations, inspections and recommendations. Now, in a typical administrative law uh, process, 
There are times where the decision-making body will appoint an investigator to say, oh, go look into this matter and come back to us and report to us so that we have some insight into these matters before we start listening to the applicants. Now, when the investigator goes out to interview people, and then they do like, you know, they conduct like a fact-finding process. The process that the investigator has conducted will not, or let me say the, the information that the investigator gathers will not be considered a final decision, right? Because they are still going to submit their reports to the decision maker. So an investigation for all intent and purposes falls under the umbrella of a preliminary decision. So if they make an investigation and you're like, oh, the, invest the investigator was a very bad person, they didn't do great, blah, blah, blah. You, you don't owe you procedural fairness at the, at, at the investigation level because it's not a final decision. And I want you guys to pay attention. If you don't ever hear anything about this again, this can stick. Every NCA exams since I have, at least since I wrote mine, I wrote mine when? Maybe six years ago, I don't know, five years ago. Every NCA exam since I wrote my exams has included an investigation issue. And do you know why? Because the NCA knows that candidates still don't get it. When they see that candidates get or they understand a particular part and there is a high pass rate in that section, they stop setting questions around it and they move to the part that candidates don't understand. And if they are still setting the question and making it available every diet, it's because people were just being lucky to have gotten 50. <laughs> people still don't get how it works. And I want you guys to pay attention. All right. So general rule, investigations are preliminary decisions. And preliminary decisions don't attract procedural fairness. However, there's an exception to that rule. So let's see what the syllabus says before we go into the exception. Um, remember, we are still under the ninth three-prong test. We are under the first factor, nature of the decision. We've talked about 1A, now we are on 1B. 1A was legislative versus administrative decisions. 1B is preliminary versus final decision. So under the preliminary decision, we are discussing investigations and recommendations, which is a kind of preliminary decision. But there are instances where an investigation can become a final decision. And that's really what the NCA focuses on in their exam questions when it comes to the common law. Um, so. Let me see where it comes up. The syllabus. All right, so the, the syllabus is saying pay attention to some of the exceptions and constraints on the triggers as well. So for legitimate expectation, note the court's view on procedural versus substantive promises. I'm going to explain this subsequently. I just don't want to lose my chain of thoughts. Then for the night trigger, the readings talk about final versus preliminary decisions and the related issue of investigations and recommendation. So let's see whether there is any other mention of investigations. Okay, that's everything they mentioned. Okay, so I'm just going to try and explain it. Now, in an investigation, so typically what happens is the Applicants, and I've been using the word applicant a lot. I hope you guys picked up on that. So when you're writing your exams, don't say plaintiff, don't say respondent, don't say appellant, don't say defendant. In every administrative law scenario, it's always an applicant. So that will, that will expose you to the examiner that you don't know what you're doing if you say appellants, okay? So applicants. So um, the in a typical administrative hearing, the applicant has applied for judicial review of a decision that they don't like. And the court, the court or whoever is listening to the review has requested for the sources of procedural fairness. They've been able to cite the enabling statutes, the general procedural statutes. Now we're on the common law and they want to see whether uh, an investigation has affected them, right? Now, when an investigator is appointed, the investigator is appointed to go and look into certain issues, not to decide the matter as a whole. So when they are looking into those issues, they are essentially trying to pass the information on to the reviewing body. However, the process of looking into the issues and what the reviewing body does can potentially make an investigation that should be a preliminary decision now become a final decision. So when will it co be considered a preliminary decision? If the investigator goes through the process and they submit their reports to the 
reviewing body and the reviewing body now decides to now conduct a hearing and they hear from the applicants, they hear from the other people that are concerned in the matter. And they also present the investigation as an exhibit for the applicants to, you know, to examine, to critique, to respond to, then the investigation will still be considered preliminary simply because it's just another piece of evidence which was tested during the hearing. However, as we have seen in several NCA exams, if the investigators submit their report and then the reviewing body does not conduct any hearing and they rely on that investigative or investigation report to make their decision, it means the hearing for all intent and purposes happened at the investigation stage, which means the investigation now becomes a final decision and everything that happened during that investigation automatically becomes reviewable for procedural fairness. Does that make sense? Let's look at the sample exam question. So this is the sample exam question on the NCA website. Well, I don't know if they've changed it, but it was there at the last diet. So um, Mr. Harnest here is currently in prison in Canada. He was extradited to Canada from Belgium on charges of computer hacking. And he complained that there are some religious discrimination in the prison where he's been held, that um, they have religious figures for Christians, Muslims, Hindu, uh, well, different kind of religions, but they didn't have for Buddhists. And he said, oh, that's discrimination. Then he then brought a the complaint to the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And you are most likely going to be faced with the Human Rights Commission in most of your questions. So he brought a complaint to the Canadian Human Rights Commission that, oh, these guys are very discriminating, you know, there are no Buddhist chaplain, and then there are pastors, there are imams and all that. And he brought it on the ground of Section 5 of the Act, which says you cannot discriminate against anyone on grounds of religion. Now, when they received his complaints, they appointed an investigator. Like I told you, very hot cake for the NCA. They always make sure to include it in their questions. They appointed an investigator as authorized under the act. Now, an investigator under the act is responsible for investigating a complaint and reporting on the material facts to the commission. Then the commission then decides whether to refer it to the full human rights tribunal proceedings. Now, the investigator did everything that she was supposed to do but then she gave a very biased feedback saying I was very skeptical even before I started. I could not establish that this guy is in fact Buddhist and he's a convicted criminal. So we must presume that he's a dishonest individual. Very, very skeptical and negative review. And that she's not prepared to believe him if he calls himself Buddhist. So fast forward to everything. What did the commission do? What did they do when they received the report? Upon receipt of the report, they convened the five meetings of members. And guess who was the chairman of that meeting? The investigator. This is a procedural fairness issue on its own, bias. Uh, sorry, uh, overlap of function. It's under is a kind of bias. Overlap of function. You are the investigator and now you're the one deciding over your report. But there are exceptions to overlap of functions too, where which we're going to get to subsequently. So she presented as, as chair and all of them deliberated on it and decided to reject to reject Ernest's complaints. And guess what? They didn't listen to Ernest. They didn't consider anything from Ernest. They never heard him. And even the investigators too said during the investigation that in a correspondence with Ernest that I will conduct an interview with you before submitting my report. However, she didn't contact Ernest. So Ernest was not involved in the investigation, which would not have been a problem on its own if a hearing was conducted and he was involved because it would have been an opportunity for him to respond to anything he didn't respond to at the investigation stage. But he didn't, re he didn't respond at the investigation stage and then at the deliberation stage, he was not involved. That is not a hearing. And which means the investigation itself should not be reviewable for procedural fairness because it was essentially what she gathered that they used to determine that this is not worth our time. They didn't consider Ernest whatsoever. And because of that, an investigation that should have been a preliminary decision then becomes a final decision. 
And when you are answering your exam question, when you are discussing the nature of the decision under the night factors, you'll be expected to properly critique that. And I can guarantee you right now, if you want AOC, you will get an investigation in your exams. And the common law is always applicable. You can write it down. <laughs> okay, so how do you know, how do you now conclude that the nature of the decision has triggered the application of the common law? It's simple. Number one, 1A, it has to be an administrative decision, and 1B, whatever the decision is, has to be a final decision. If it's a legislative decision, number one is already not triggered. If it's a preliminary decision, except it's an investigation that then becomes final, number one is not triggered. So then moving on to number two, number two of the three prong factor says the relationship existing between the admin body and the individual. This relationship, again, I mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier that um, in this relationship, I mentioned earlier that what triggers the relationship between, what triggers the relationship between an applicant and the, uh, the decision-making body? It's because the statute gave that decision-making body authority over the applicant to decide the rights, interests, and privileges of that applicant. That's what triggers that relationship. Now, the next question now is, how do you decipher the relationship that is existing between an admin body and an individual, and how does that affect procedural fairness? Remember the background or the backdrop to this case, what really happened in this night versus Indian Ed. The guy was a public office employee, uh, public employee, and he was dismissed, and he's saying they should have granted him procedural fairness, and the courts initially agreed, but subsequently disagreed in Dunsmuir, saying, no, this is an employee-employer relationship. You should be governed by your contract, except you fall under the three exceptions, which we call the Dunsmuir exceptions. Except you fall under those three exceptions, employee-employer contracts should be governed by their contracts. But if the nature of your relationship is such that the reason why you are in, a, in bed, the reason why you are in bed, let me put it that way in layman terms, please don't write that in the exams. The reason why you are in bed with that decision maker is because you didn't have a choice, but because the enabling law puts you in their jurisdiction. That is a true administrative law relationship. That's the layman way of explaining it. What does that mean? Again, going back to the IRB, uh, IRCC example, I did not choose I did not choose to submit to the IRCC. The enabling law says they are the only ones that can review visa applications. Right? I, because if they say, okay, oh, you can send the application to anybody, then I would have maybe chosen to send it to, uh, I don't know, the World Bank or anywhere or a place where I've been favored. But their law says, if you want to come to Canada, the only person that we review <laughs> is the IRCC. So that puts me under their jurisdiction. And then the moment I'm under their jurisdiction, they now have the rights, that they have the power and the authority to determine whether I make it to Canada or not. So in determining whether I will make it to Canada, they have to be fair. And that is a true administrative law relationship. But if I'm an employee of IRCC and I signed a contract with them to be an employee, that's, I mean, I chose to go there. So except these three exceptions are applied to you, the nature of the relationship cannot be that of an employee-employer, which is ex exactly what happened in the Dunsmere case. And then the third factor, the third factor is the effect of the decision on the individual's rights, interests, and privileges. That's the third factor. The effect of the decision on the individual's rights, interests, and privileges. Now, uh, I don't want to go into the details of how this was expanded. That's just going to waste our time. But the simple way of understanding this is, this is a very subjective test. And you will need to look into your exam question before you are able to decipher whether this has any effect on an individual's rights, interests, and privileges. And for example, in the case of Baker, I think, no, maybe it wasn't Baker, but there was a particular case where a guy, there was a decision to deport him. And if, if he's claiming that if he's deported, he's going to be killed because he came to Canada as a refugee under claiming that, oh, he's, he's a member of the LGBTQ community and his country is, 
you know, his country has criminal laws against anyone that is a member of the LGBTQ community. So that kind of person will say the effect of a wrong decision that is not procedurally fair will be that if I go back, I'm going to die. And that person can say, oh, the effect, like Mr. Hannes, they can say the effect is, oh, they've discriminated against me and the effect is my mental health. So which is why I'm saying that it's a very subjective factor. And more often than not, it's probably one that you can easily figure out based on your exam question. So I don't think we need to go into the details about the theoretical analysis of that. So now those are the three prong factors. Now, if these three factors all point towards the existence of a duty of fairness, then we can now say that the common law has been triggered. So how do they point towards the existence of a duty of fairness? The nature of the decision factor, number one, has to point to the fact that it's a final decision and it's an administrative decision. If one of them is missing, there's a problem. The second factor has to point that the relationship existing between both admin body and the individual is an administrative one and not an employee-employer one, except you fall under the three Dunsmere exceptions, which are this. And the third factor has to show that the decision has a negative effect on the right, interest, and privilege of the individual. So once those three factors are all pointing towards the existence of a duty to be fair, then you can say the ninth three-prong test has triggered the application of the common law. Does that make sense? So that's the first trigger for common law. The second trigger is the concept of legitimate expectation. Now, these two triggers, are not mutually, um, uh, also what's the right word now? They can be applied separately. Let me just break it down so I don't use unnecessary English. They can be applied separately in the sense that KTP alone, the nitrate prong test alone can trigger the common law. And the legitimate expectation alone too can trigger the common law. And you can have both, but all you need is one. But it does not mean you will not analyze it in your exam. You still have to analyze it to show that it applies or not. So what does the concept of legitimate expectation mean? Legitimate expectation, according to the syllabus, yeah. Uh, you know, the court says, uh, the syllabus says, with legitimate expectations, the content of the procedural obligation is generally what was promised in the procedural promise that gave rise to the legitimate expectation in the first place. And the syllabus now says, if the promise was substantive, you will not be able to enforce it directly. But at the very least, it may lead to enhanced or more procedural fairness. What does that mean? That's a very, that's a very huge statement. All right, um, so let's talk about legitimate expectation in detail and see how we can break that down. Can somebody read this chapter three for us? I feel like we should, uh, yeah, can someone read chapter three for us, please? Anybody? I will do that, please. Now that you understand, now that you understand that procedural obligations come from a number of different sources, you need to understand which of these procedural rules applies where. We call this trigger or threshold. Where, where is a given procedural obligation triggered? Where procedural rules come from legislations? Typically, but not always, the legislation that gives the decision maker is our powers in the first place. The answer to the trigger question is in the legislation itself. So, so too with the general status, status about procedure, they contain their own triggers. So you need to be careful to read that, leg that legislation if it applies to your decision maker. Can I go on? Sure. A word of, a word of warning. Make sure that the statute does apply to your decision maker. 
ask, would the provincial general procedure statute ever apply to a federal administrative decision maker? Also realize that even when there is a statutory provision for a year, there may be questions as to who is entitled to participate. This is particularly important where the matters in issue are hearings about big projects such as oil and gas pipelines. Here too, the terms of the statutory provision may be critical and issues can arise out of sections that give the hearing body discretion as to participatory rights. We can make more general observations about other sources of procedural obligations. The, reading, the readings focus in particular on the trigger for common law procedural fairness. Basically, there are two triggers. Uh, can you please show me the next page? Yes, okay. Basically, there are two triggers. What we can call the Knight versus India Aid three point the trigger and a concept known as legitimate expectation. Where the requirement of these triggers are met, then procedural fairness is, is owned by the administrative decision maker. What that means in practice is a more complex discussion invo involving consideration of the content of the procedural fairness. More on that below. For our purposes here, make sure you understand when common law procedural fairness is triggered and be, sh and be sure you focus your attention on the modern rules. There's, there's issue in this guidance. We should help clarify the modern rules. We should help. Okay, there is there is history in this guidance. We should help clarify where the modern rule where the modern rule comes from. But history is history, and on the exam you need to understand the rules that apply now. Pay attention to some exception and concentrate on the triggers as well. So for legitimate ex expectation, note the court views on procedural versus substantive promises. For the ninth trigger, the readings talk about final fi final versus preliminary decisions and the related issue of investigation and recommendations. Note also exceptions to this exception. With okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. thanks. Um I, I, I just realized that I was, you know, picking that chapter in bits and pieces that may just be helpful for us to go through it in detail and read the complete thing. So for legitimate expectation, well, we've talked about the night three prong trigger, so I, we don't need to overflog that again. But for the legitimate expectation concept, legitimate expectation is exactly as the name denotes, an expectation that is legitimate. That is, you add an expectation that something was going to be done and you had a good reason to believe it should have been done. And then if it's not done, you will feel like you've been denied something. It's very similar to the concept of promissory estoppel in contract. In the law of contract, promissory estoppel essentially says that if two parties, there's been an offer, intention, blah, 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 all the elements of the contract, but two parties have made an agreement and one party's position has changed because of that agreement that the other party is then stopped from saying, oh, I'm no longer interested in the contract. And I think I remember there was a case, the guy was going to import some cars into the UK. And for whatever reason, they didn't reduce the agreement into writing. But then this guy has already begun the process of shipping the cars. They were already on the ICs halfway to England. And then the other party said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm no longer interested in that purchase. The court said no you will be stopped from backing out because this person's position has changed. They spent considerable amount of money to start the import process and they probably won't be able to recover the economic value of what they've put into the, you know, the process of importing something that you requested for. Anyways, legitimate expectation is very similar to that, but there are some differences. And the number one is, for legitimate expectation, you don't need to prove that your position has changed. In fact, you don't need to prove anything. You only need to prove that you expected it and you had the right reason to have expected it. You don't need to prove that, oh, I've done this, I've done that, these are the damages I've suffered. That's not required. So what are the two types of legitimate expectation? Number one, we call it express legitimate expectation or legitimate expectation or a promise that was made expressly. And then the second one is expectation that was implied from practice. 
So when we say express legitimate expectation, we are referring to a promise that is made either in writing or that someone says, communicates to you orally. Similar to the sample exam question here, this is an example of legitimate expectation. The investigator reaching out to Ernest saying, before I submit my report, I will conduct an interview with you. That is a promise. And that's a promise that was made in writing because she said she mentioned it in her correspondence. That was a promise in writing. So that's an express legitimate expectation. Another example of a legitimate expectation could be, for example, when for people that were already in Canada at the time, when COVID-19 happened in 2020, the prime minister went on TV and said, anyone that loses their job, we are going to give you CERB to cope. And then they came around again a few months later that any student that is unable to work now, we're going to give you CER something. I don't know what they call it for the students so that they can survive in Canada. That was a promise. And by the end of the month, I'm sure everybody was expecting that deposit in their bank accounts because they had a reason to expect that promise. Now, the other type of legitimate expectation is the one implied from practice. So this has nothing to do with something that was written down or communicated to someone, but you look at a, you observe a set of past practices and you came to the conclusion that if this was done in several other cases, then it should be done in my own case too. Or you believe there was no reason for them to deviate. And a very good example of that happens in union cases. If you, if you go into your note on legitimate expectation, you see that most of the judicial decisions on it are cases that have to do with like faculty workers, union workers. So for example, like I mentioned at the beginning of this class, I'm also, in addition to my legal career, I'm also a faculty staff at a community college in Calgary here, yeah? and I'm part of the faculty association, which essentially protects my job in the, in the, in the, in the school. That is, I mean, of course, anybody can get fired, but it protects you. Unions protect you from like mass layoffs. For example, we heard during the COVID-19 that Air Canada, WestJet, and several other big organizations were laying off thousands and thousands of workers. That's what unions tend to prevent. That if you're going to lay people off, you have to give them fair compensation. Compensation. You have to ensure that you communicate it to them early. There has to be some sort of work around. So it's not going to be just abrupt which is why you see some job, they will say, oh, it's a non-unionized job because they don't want you to be able to stop them from making any rash decision if they have to make it. Anyways, the long and short of that is if a faculty association or a union association already has a collective agreement with the employer that if you want to lay off more than 50 people, you have to give us six month notice. That is, you would have told us and then you still keep on paying those people for six months for them to look for another job. And they've been doing that for the last 50 years. If you then join that institution and you become a member of that union, and then someone says, for example, let's say I'm the member of that union and it's 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 during the COVID-19 period and they just paid us a bonus. And someone said, oh, I heard they'll be laying people off tomorrow. Now don't spend your bonus or spend your bonus wisely in case they lay you off. And I'm like, no, in the last 50 years, if they want to lay off people, like if they want to conduct a mass layoff, they usually let the union know and the union will let the members of the union know. And we will have six months to transition to another job that I'm pretty sure that I can go and enjoy my life in Cancun with this money. I don't think they will lay us off just yet. And lo and behold, I resume work the next day and my access, access pass was not working. I can now say I had a, legis a legitimate in, in, uh, expectation that was implied from a past practice that you will not lay us off without that notice. But there are exceptions, which is what the syllabus says. The syllabus says, note the exceptions to these and the exceptions to these exceptions. So the exception to these is that when it comes to that kind of legitimate expectation um, for the legitimate expectation that is implied by, you know, from practice, by practice, you need to know about that practice. If you don't know about the practice, how did you expect it? If you didn't know that the unions will usually get like a notice for six months, then you cannot say I had an expectation. You didn't know about the practice. I, you know, I, I was having this class with a couple of candidates a while ago, 
and somebody asked a very ingenious question and they said, how would the examiner, how would they know that I didn't know about the practice? Like, how would they know? Well, it's based on your exam question. If your, if your question says the applicant didn't know about the practice, then they, then they didn't know. If your question says that they did, then they did. But if your question is silent on that, then you are allowed to make assumptions. Now, rules around the assumptions in your exams, if your number one, your question has to be completely silent on that issue. Number two, your assumptions cannot change the nature of the question. It's only helping fill in the gaps. If your assumption changes the nature of the question, you're on your way to failure. Where you are confused and you're not sure, then just don't make assumptions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, legitimate expectation implied from practice, express. So if it's implied from practice, you have to know about the practice. Another good example of implied from practice is I do have in my regular classes, my intensive classes, I do give out assignments. So if somebody now says, if somebody now comes to the class and says, oh, Kenny boy, I heard you always give assignments, but you haven't given us any assignments. And I'm like, okay, 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 you caught me. I'll give you assignments now. So, but what if you didn't know that I was giving assignments in my regular classes? You cannot expect it because you cannot expect what you don't know. Now, there is a general exception to legitimate expectation as a principle, whether express or implied, which is that you cannot use legitimate expectation to generate a substantive outcome. And that's what the syllabus says here, that notes, the readings talk about final, oh, sorry, no, that's not it. Yeah, the, note the court's views on procedural versus substantive promises. Procedural versus substantive promises. And we need to break that down. I mean, if that's, we probably won't be able to touch everything, but if we can touch on that, that would be great. So what are procedural promises? What are substantive promises? Now, this is where candidates start to mix things up. We're not talking about procedural fairness review and substantive review. Yeah, no. This only has to do with legitimate expectation. A procedural promise is a promise that lends itself to procedures, while a substantive promise lends itself to outcomes. What are examples of a procedural promise? When the ends, after COVID-19 started in 2020, um, I remember we were about to start one of our classes then, you know, in the March diet. Well, it was a quarterly thing then. It wasn't like the exams were not monthly. Then the NCA made a, made a statement saying, because we are, we are that, well, they made a statement or they issued an advisory saying we are going online. Exams are going online. And all my candidates started panicking that, oh my God, how are we going to cope? And then the NCA added another statement, another advice was saying, well, we had an extra hour and the exams will go from three hours to four hours. Of course, they eventually went back full circle to three hours. But then initially it was four hours and some people were beneficiaries of the four hour exams. Now, that was a promise that when you get to your exam, and you switch on your laptop and you're writing online, because of the challenges of switching online, we give you one extra hour. So what if I switched on my laptop and I'm, right, I'm ready to face my exams and you guys are my pro proctors, and then I see the timer, then I see two hours, 59 minutes remaining. It means the NCA did not deliver on their promise, right? So now the question is, the promise to give me or to issue or allot an extra hour, is that a procedural promise or a substantive promise? And I'm going to ask everybody. Because I need, I think some people have been, and in case you don't know, if you are not on camera, you are the ones I always start with. People on camera, you are safe. So if you're not on camera, get ready. So is that a substantive promise or procedural promise? Natasha, <laughs> I can see people popping up on camera in droves. <laughs> Natasha, what do you think? Is that a procedural promise or substantive promise? And if you don't respond in my class, I, I have the tradition of removing the person from class. So please respond. Mm -hmm. If you don't know it, say I don't know it. It's better than just being nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Natasha, 
Okay, we'll move on to the next person. Um, Adela. Mm, it is substantive. I don't know. So why do you think it's a substantive promise? Because it wasn't the legislation about that. was just a procedural thing. Mm, interesting. Um, uh, Eniola, what are your thoughts? Um, Terry, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not able to give to, to respond right now. I don't know. Okay. Not, um, I see Natasha is requesting to join the class again. So, Natasha, do you want to share your thoughts with us? Natasha, we can't hear you. Um, Oma A, do you want to tell us what you think? Okay, so I, I think it's procedural because um, they just they promised that time, but it has nothing to do with the outcome, which means that you might pass or fail. That's what okay. I think. Anybody agrees or disagrees with Omar? I, I do feel like it's procedural, probably for okay. the Okay, why do you think it's procedural, Sylvia? I think it relates more to the procedure of the exam rather than it's a substantive issue. Largely what Omar said as well. This is my thoughts. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And the best way to identify a procedural promise and substantive promise is ask, ask yourself that in this situation, what would be the outcome? What would be the definitive outcome that is the end of all proceedings? In an exam, the outcome is to pass, right? But if they grant you one extra hour, the extra hour is not the same thing as saying you have passed. The extra hour is just to give you an opportunity to present your case because writing your exam is you presenting your case, right? So they give you one extra hour to present your case. It still doesn't guarantee that you're, you are presenting the right case. You could be presenting the wrong case for the next six hours. So if they come on and say, oh, because you're writing online, you are guaranteed to pass. You know, there are some, there are some, um, and I'm, I'm not going to mention any name to avoid a defamation lawsuit. There are some programs in Canada where they'll tell you if you enroll, you've passed these exams. You do, you know, you know that, right? So that's that would be like an outcome. And guess what? You cannot enforce that promise. You can't say I had an expectation. That's what the syllabus is saying. Well, that's what the law says, not just the syllabus. You can't. Um, where is it again? Well, find out. So, sorry. Procedural versus substantive promises. And we can see. Uh, you will see. So see, they are saying if the promise was substantive, you will not be able to enforce it directly. But at the very least, it may lead to enhanced or more procedural fairness. Now, we're going to discuss what this means when we get to the case of Baker versus Canada under the five Baker factors, if we get there. That's where you will see how it can lead to enhanced or more procedural fairness. But the general rule is if the promise is substantive in nature, it simply means then that legitimate expectation will not trigger common law. If the promise that gave rise to the legitimate expectation is substantive. Does that make sense? Or did I lose you? Did I lose you guys somewhere? Remember, we were talking about the triggers for common law, and we've talked about the night three prompt trigger, and we got to the legitimate expectation as a trigger. And we said there are two types, express, implied. Some authors will tell you there are three. And the third one, according to those authors, is the combination of express and implied, which doesn't make any sense. And the, imp and the exception to the implied from practice is that you have to know about the practice, but the general exception to legitimate expectation as a whole is you cannot use a promise, a legit, or you can't use legitimate expectation to generate a substantive outcome. That is, whatever led, to, whatever promise gave rise to, rise to the legitimate, legitimate expectation must not be substantive in nature. It has to be procedural in nature, because if it's substantive, you can't enforce it, at least not directly, but you can use it to get more procedural fairness but you can't say oh i had a legitimate expectation and if you can't say that then it means legitimate expectation can't trigger common law for the purpose of that question that you're answering 
Okay, moving on to the Charter. Like I said, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom is technically the Constitution because it's part of the Constitution. And the only thing we are concerned about when it comes to the Charter in admin law is Section 7, Life, Liberty, and Security. Uh, and you see that in the syllabus here, uh, the syllabus tells us, I know for some of you that you've written the constitutional law exams, you may get a bit confused here because you still feel like, oh, I should talk about section 15, section this. No, we only care about section 7. And you will see here in the syllabus, it says it will almost be wrong in an admin law exam to discuss charter rights other than section 7. You are not being examined on section 11 rights or section 2 or section 15. And section 11D, for instance, will not even apply except the criteria for its application are met, which is existence of contempt powers. So to just make it very simple for you guys, focus only on section 7 when it comes to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom, at least for the purposes of your administrative law exams. Nothing else. Now, what does section 7 say? Section 7 says, and I think we can probably, maybe I can open up my charter documents here. Section 7 says, um, everyone, let me see, can I, can I bring that on the screen? I'm not sure it's clear enough. Everyone has a right to life, liberty, and security of the persons and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So you will see that the emphasis on section seven is what? The right to three things. The right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to what? Security of persons, which is why we say the triggers for the charter are what? Life, liberty, and security. So for you to claim that the charter has been triggered as a source of procedural fairness, you have to be able to prove that there is a threat to the life of the applicant, number one, or there is an issue with the applicant's liberty, or there is an issue with the security of persons of the applicant. Now, the good thing is, any one of these can trigger the application of section seven. You don't need to say, oh, there must be life, liberty, and security. That's almost impossible. Life alone is enough. Liberty alone is enough. And security alone is enough. Now, um, when we talk about life, we essentially mean threat to life, or it doesn't have to necessarily mean that, and that's a whole jurisprudence on itself that I don't want to go into right now, but it doesn't mean that it's immediate. I know there was a case law as to whether the threat is something for, I think the case law was about this guy that was going to travel to his country and he was going to be killed if he travels. And they were like, it doesn't have to be immediate. As long as the, that threat exists, then that is potentially an issue. Security is a bit, um, it's, it's a bit different in the sense that there's an additional layer of security that we also focus on in admin law, which is psychological security. And this was established in Blanco's case, where the court said that if there has been some sort of psychological arm to an applicant, that can also trigger Section 7. What do we mean by psychological arm? That is something that is mental, uh, psychological rather, and it must have been as a result of a state action. That is, the state did something that led to that thing. Let me see if I can bring up more details. Uh, charter, charter. Yeah, so in, in the Blanco case, the court essentially mentioned that the direct cause of the harm to the respondent was not the state caused delay in the human rights process. Why the respondent has suffered serious prejudice in connection with the allegations of sexual harassment against him for Section 7 to be engaged, there must be a sufficient causal connection between the state caused delay and the prejudice suffered. So what happened was in this case, this guy was accused of sexual harassment and there was a delay 
in the human rights process itself. I can't remember exactly. I think he was exonerated. He wasn't as exactly found guilty, I think. But you know the way, you know, the, you know, you guys know about sensationalism. People like bad news. The moment they heard about it, it already affected him. You know, I think he maybe was maybe he was even a politician. I can't remember. It affected him already. And he was now trying to sue for a you know, for an infringement on the security of persons based on the Blanco psychological security. And psychological security says, number one, there must have been a sort of arm, and the harm must be psychological, and it must have been caused by a state action. And there must be a sufficient causal connection between the harm that you have suffered and the action of the states. So what this case is that now is essentially saying is that, oh, fine, you suffered harm, but it wasn't because of a state action. The states were not the ones that were spreading information all over social media about the sexual harassment allegation. The state was the human rights, uh, human rights commission that was trying to try the matter. And in trying the matter, they did not, re any information that anybody got, they found a way to get it. It wasn't because the state went on TV to say, oh, you are guilty. And they followed their regular procedure. And even if the delay, even if there was a delay, the delay was not the reason for the social media activity. The delay cannot be linked to the prejudice suffered. So that's another angle for the charter. And the final one is liberty. So liberty essentially presupposes freedom, freedom, freedom of movement. But again, in addition to that, there's an expansion of liberty in admin law in the case of Wilson versus BC Medical. So in that BC Medical versus Wilson case, um, what happened was this guy is a doctor, uh, the guy is a doctor and he essentially, you know, in Canada, for anyone that doesn't know about this, I'm assuming everyone does, in Canada, well, we all know that healthcare is free to a reasonable degree, your taxes pay for it, so it's not, it's not like it's exactly free, but it's free, you don't have to pay from, pay from, pay from your pocket, and the medical doctors, they build the government after you visited the doctors. So you visit them, they build the government. And for them to be able to build the government, they need a practitioner number. Without the practitioner number, you can't build government. And if you can't, people won't come to your clinic because I, for one, will not go to a clinic that requires me to pay when the next one is free if I present my health card. So this guy moved to BC. And when he got to BC, he wasn't issued that practitioner number. He was not allowed to essentially practice. He was deprived of his means of livelihood. And he appealed the decision on the ground of the charter, like as a you know, denial of his liberty rights, claiming that this has affected him in a way that, you know, that impugns or you know, that, that, that affects his liberty rights rather. Then the court was able to now distinguish between that case and pure economic rights because he is claiming that this is the right, you know, he has been denied the right to, you know, pursue a means of livelihood. And they are saying that, are you sure that's not just an economic right as against the liberty right in the charter? And you have to really be careful about this in your exams. And I'm going to read this excerpt so that you can understand the perspective of the courts. Now, the issue in question was initially characterized as the right to work, which presupposes a pure economic question. However, the court ought to have directed its attention to a more important aspect of liberty, which is the right to pursue a livelihood or profession, a matter that concerns one's dignity, sense of self-worth, and professional fulfillment. Now, according to the court in that case, the appellant's case is that the government has deprived them of the opportunity to pursue their profession or has restricted their mobility in such a way as to deprive them of liberty in the broad sense in which their freedom is to be interpreted under the charter. The economic component of that freedom which the doctors seek to assert is the right to be paid by or on behalf of the patient for services that may be rendered. So two things, the right to carry on their profession, a separate right. Then the right to be paid for it is the right to work aspect. And that right to carry on that their profession like any other person is the one that the court is now categorizing as an expansion of liberty rights. Because it now essentially means that 
liberty rights is not just the right of movement anymore. It now includes that right that potentially, if it's a matter that concerns your dignity, your sense of self-worth and professional fulfillment, it will trigger liberty rights under Section 7. But again, you have to be really clear about that and not mix it. An example, and not mix them together. An example of an economic right case is the Smith Klein and French Laboratories Limited versus Attorney General of Canada. Unfortunately, I can't go into detail, in, into more further detail, otherwise, we run the risk of not even getting to the substantive review aspect today. So, moving on. Uh, so that triggers the charter, then the Bill of Rights, Section 1A and 2E are the triggers for the Bill of Rights. For Constitution Act of 1982, Section 35 triggers this. Why? This applies to indigenous people. When you go to Chapter 6 of your syllabus, there are triggers for indigenous people, which is called the constitutional duty to consult and accommodate indigenous peoples. And the origin of that duty can be found in Section 35 of the Constitution Act. I want to see if I can, I have a sort of um, framework for that, that I think I can maybe quickly run through with you guys. Uh, it may be a bit helpful for anyone that I won't see their face again after today. So this is like a structure to answer any question on duty to consult. So for every duty to consult question, again, you have to start from their own source too. Their source is section 35 of the Constitution Act. And of course, there are cases like R versus Badger, R versus Marshall, you know, which talks about the source. So the source is in that section 35, which provides and codifies the indigenous right of indigenous peoples in Canada. Then the triggers are the Crown has actual constructive knowledge of a potential abol Aboriginal claim or title. There is a contemplated Crown conduct or pending Crown decision. And there is a potential adverse impact of the Crown conduct or action on the claimed Aboriginal rights. And of course, then you now need to go into the content, which I won't go into now because we are not yet in content. But for the purpose of the constitutional duty to consult, the source is section, is section 35 of the Constitution Act. And of course, the trigger is that section 35. We're going to talk about that subsequently. Uh, one last thing I want to mention on these sources before we go into the contents is when it's this enabling statute as a source can potentially also include what we call delegated legislations and regulations. Now, there's a bit of an issue with those. And the syllabus also warns us about that. I, I want I want to quickly you know make reference to that before I move on. The syllabus tells us that the assigned readings talk about enabling legislation, delegated legislation guidelines, but for reasons discussed in the textbooks, be careful, be cautious with this. Now, what the syllabus is trying to point to you is that all these form part of the enabling statutes most of the time, but not all of the time. Or let me say, they may not be applicable to the applicants all of the time. And the simple format or formula for determining that is simple. The power to make any sort of delegated laws is usually provided for in the enabling statute of the decision maker. Which means if that power has not been provided for in the enabling statutes and the decision maker decides to make a delegated law, then that law for all intent and purposes is just a soft law. It's not binding on an applicant. Does that make sense? You cannot make a law that you have not been empowered to make. That's the interpretation. If you do go ahead and make it, it does not, it doesn't bind the applicant. And you as an applicant should not be relying on it as a source of procedural fairness obligation. Okay, moving on. So the enabling statute will apply to all decision makers that it has been that it was designed for. General procedural statutes will only apply to the provinces that have them, like our brother has its own Quebec, BC, Ontario, just those provinces alone. The common law applies to all decision makers as long as, as, it, as, long as it, it's, it's been triggered. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom applies to who? Who wants to guess? 
I feel like calling someone. Um, I don't know. This person didn't introduce themselves when they joined the class. I'm going to try and pronounce your name. Please pardon me if I murder it. Yuri Shamaki. Please pardon me if I murdered it. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so what do you think? Um, I think the charter um, applies to the government of Canada as federal government. No, no, no. I mean, in terms of decision makers, we know there are two types of decision makers. There are decision makers that were established by a legislative assembly of a particular province, and there are decision makers that were established by the federal parliament of Canada. Now, would the charter apply to both of them or just one of them? Yeah, it applies to both of them. Why? Um, because I'm I'm not sure about the section of this the constitution that says um, the charter applies to both the government of Canada and the Parliament of Canada. So in in, in such an instance, I believe that um, the ADM, um, whether federal or provincial, whether the, their source of power is from the federal government or provincial um the charter will apply to them yeah that's correct and to simplify that the charter is the constitution the constitution applies across canada so it applies to everybody across canada and bill of rights um i feel like calling someone else um or dear i haven't heard that person's voice or seen their face too today what do you think what do you think the bill of rights will apply to Please, if you don't know, just say you don't know. Don't be mute. Okay, um, moving on to the next person. Um, Sylvia, what do you think? I'm not very sure, but I think it should apply to everyone. Why do you think the Bill of Rights should apply to everyone? Maybe close. We, okay, no, it, it's. I, I think because of connection to like the constitution. So I, I don't know. Does anyone agree with Sylvia? Or disagree? I think I'm going to disagree with her. Okay, Mustafa, why do you disagree? Um, I think it should it should be applicable to just the parliament, uh, the federal decision makers alone, because it, why? that's. Uh, because the the Bill of Rights is only uh, applicable to the federal government and not to the provincial government. That's correct. The bill is just a federal legislation. Remember, it was the first attempt to codify human rights laws in Canada before the Charter, and it wasn't included as part of the Constitution as it, at the time. So for all, for all intent and purposes, they were potentially hoping that the provinces will adopt them. So in the absence of the adoption, it remains just a federal law, which means it only binds federal entities only. So if your decision maker was created by a provincial legislative assembly, the bill will not apply as a source of procedural fairness obligation. Okay, so now that's that. Moving on, um, I think we have less than we have less than one hour before this class ends, and I need to just keep to substantive review. So for the content, before you begin content, you need to start your conversation with the analysis of the five Baker factors, and that's what the syllabus says. If you go to chapter, if you go to chapter um, seven, chapter seven will tell you, we turn now to this question, if procedural obligations are triggered, what does the decision maker have to do? That is, you have been able to touch on the fact that procedural obligations have been triggered. So now the next thing is that what does a decision maker have to do? The question is whatever, if, you, if your procedural obligation comes from a statute, the enabling act or one of the special legislated procedural codes, the answer to this question is whatever the statute says is the contents is the contents. However, there may be occasions in which you will have to determine whether the statute is a complete code or leaves room for common law supplementation. So the way this works is all of the contents in your notes, they are based on the common law. The contents in the statute you will find out in your exam on the day of your exam based on the statutes that you will get in the exam. But the ones in your notes are based off of the common law. 
because those were based on past decisions of courts. And that's what the syllabus is saying here. And life is more complex if your trigger is a common law. We don't need to worry about that. Now, the basic issue, Baker, the, so certainly with respect to the right to be heard, you must start with the Baker considerations. Baker gives you a non-exclusive list of considerations that tell you at least something about contents. Specifically, the Baker test suggests whether the contents will be robust or not. I won't go into the Baker test today, unfortunately, because that's going to take us another 30 minutes. Now, when you're done with the Baker test and you've been able to determine whether it is robust or not, there are five factors and there are ways you have to determine whether it's robust. Then the next thing is you then move to the content issues. And these are examples of content issues. Notice, bias, discovery, right to counsel, oral hearing, cross-examination. And you will need to examine these content issues one after the other based on the ones that were denied your applicants. So in the exams, there are probably like what? I don't know. Let me see. Maybe like 15 content issues. I should have them. Yeah, so these are content issues. Some authors divided them in their notes to into two, right to be heard and right to an unbiased decision maker. Some, you see them pre-hearing issues, hearing issues, post-hearing issues. They are all the same thing. They are just, they, are, they just made the division based on what they're comfortable with. But the point is, you are not expected in the exam to run through all of these content issues because each one can take you 15 to 20 minutes. You are expected to look at your exam question and ask yourself, which of these content issues did this decision maker deprive my applicants? Once you've been able to check them and you can create something similar to these that I have in the framework, I have these um, worksheets in the framework that essentially lists possible procedural fairness rights and maybe other possible 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 substantive issues and the idea behind this that it, this is that you want to run through your exam question and ask yourself does any one of these issue arise or is an issue that needs analysis in my question if any one of them arises from your question then you need to discuss it and conclude that oh this was deprived my applicants or otherwise. Then when you're done, and you're done with your procedural fairness analysis, you then conclude. You then conclude and say, based on this, oh yeah, one thing that you also add, which was introduced into the new syllabus that was recently released, is this case of Society of Composers, Authors, Music Publishers of Canada versus Canadian Association of Internet Providers. Essentially, what the case deals with is it introduced a standard of review for procedural fairness, which was not clear prior to now. Prior to now, it was just anything goes. But now this introduced a definite standard and you are expected to include this in your analysis in your exams. And that standard is the correctness standard. Again, we can't go into the detail of that, but I expect that you guys can study your notes, you know, based off of that knowledge. Now, once you do that, you then conclude and then you are done with your procedural fairness analysis. And now you can now begin the substantive review analysis. Any questions so far? All right, moving on. So for substantive review, substantive review is a bit different in the sense that this has nothing to do with procedures. It's not interested in procedures. It doesn't want to know whether you were granted notice or whether there was a uh, um, right to counsel or whether they were biased. Substantive review issues does not bother itself or concern itself with that. When it comes to substantive review, you are considering the issue itself, or the, the decision itself. So let's look at the decision. If I make a decision right now that um, none of you can attend my classes anymore, you are banned from attending my classes, that's a decision. So the procedural aspect will concern itself with how I made that decision. Did I ask you guys to make a submission to defend yourself? Did I notify you before I made that decision? Those are procedural. Or was I biased because I don't like your faces? Those are procedural concerns. But the substantive concern we now ask that is the decision itself a good decision? And to determine if that decision is a good one, you need to review it with, a, with you know, by a standard. 
And that is what leads to the concept of standard of review. And that's what leads to the concept of standard of review. Now, prior to now, or let me say historically, we used to have three standards of review. And the first standard was the standard of patent on reasonableness. Then we also had reasonableness simplicity, and then we had the standard of correctness. In fact, it's almost like every decade, the standard of review changes in the Canadian administrative law jurisprudence. So a decade later or so, in the case of Dunsmere, the court fused the standard of patent on reasonableness and reasonableness simplicity into one standard of reasonableness. And then we also have one standard of correctness. But then there's these standards, there has to be like a roadmap for identifying which one you should apply, right? You need to know, you need like a set of rules to know this is how I apply this and this is how I apply the other one. So as at that time, that roadmap were, was called the pragmatic and functional factors. And Prior to Donsmia, we had those pragmatic and functional factors and those three standards of review. Post Donsmia, the standard of reviews became two, reasonableness and correctness. And I think I have some notes on that here. It became two, reasonableness and correctness. And um, sorry, I'm trying to see if I have any note on that so I can just put it in your, on the screen for you to follow me. I think I do. I'm having to skip some things because of time. Oh. Yeah, so was Donsmia, the pragmatic and functional factors, which were four of them, they were abolished. And those may introduce default assumptions as the roadmap for identifying the standard of review and then maintained the two standards of reasonableness and correctness. Then Vavilov came around December 19, 2019, the trilogy of admin law, Vavilov, Bell, NFL, those three cases were decided on the same day by the Supreme Court. And guess what happened? The Supreme Court clarified and eliminated both pragmatic and functional factors and the default assumptions. And the Supreme Court also introduced Another standard to admin law. Now, it's not a new standard. It's been in existence, just not in admin law. And then the Supreme Court introduced the standard called, um, what's it called again? Palpable and overriding error, making for three standards of review. Now, correctness, reasonableness, palpable and overriding error. But then the Supreme Court also introduced a different roadmap for identifying which standard you should apply which is now called the Vavilov Standard Selection System. So this Vavilov Standard Selection System is what I have on my screen as a chart. So the standard is essentially says, start with a presumption that reasonableness is your standard. So the Standard Selection System says, start with a presumption that reasonableness is the standard of review. And then with all presumptions, presumptions were made to be rebutted, right? Try and rebut that presumption to know whether this presumption can stand. And in rebutting the presumption, the very first step to rebutting the presumption that reasonableness is your standard is to ask yourself, does the statute provide for a standard of review? That is the enabling statute that established the decision maker does it provide for a standard of review? If the statute provides for a standard, then that is what you should be applying and your analysis should end there. I mean, of course, you're expected to still write out the entire selection system for the purposes of the exam, but for the purposes of identifying your standard of review, your analysis ends there. That's your standard. Whatever your statute says, it is. But what if the statute doesn't provide for a standard? Then the next question you need to ask yourself is to ask, does the statute provide for a right of appeal? If the statute provides for a right of appeal, then you need to ask some other questions. What is I the nature? Question. I'm sorry, what... I have a question. Can you hold on a bit? So I don't forget yeah, yeah, sure, my sure, chain sure. of thoughts. And if you have sure, a question, use the raise your hand feature 
so that you don't interrupt my chain of thought and I will take it when I'm done. Thanks. So if the statute provides for a right of appeal, then you need to ask what is the nature of the issue in question? The nature of the issue in question is what will now let you or help you determine the standard that you will apply. Now, there are three potential natures or issues that could be in question. Number one, it could be a question of law. It could also be a question of facts. And it could be a question of mixed facts and law. Now, that itself requires a bit of a breakdown. But before I go ahead to break it down, what is your question? Oh, yeah. So sorry for interrupting. Uh, my question is about the first uh, condition. The pro uh, does the statute uh, provide a, uh, provide for a standard? I couldn't. I cannot figure out what does does it mean to provide for a standard. What's the standard here? And the standard of review. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah, so I, I said I mentioned that. If you remember that I mentioned that at the beginning of our conversation that you um. In administrative law, essentially what we're doing in admin law is to ensure that administrative agencies are exercising the powers and the authority that has been granted to them by law within the ambit of the law. And if they go out of that exercise, if they exceed the exercise of the authority that has been granted to them, then an applicant that is right or is or a right or their rights and interests and privileges has been affected can go to court for judicial review. And the process of conducting that review is to look at the procedural aspect and the substantive aspect and decide on the remedies. And we've discussed the procedural aspect, and now we are looking at the substantive aspect. That when you are, and, and I mentioned that in considering the substan substantive aspect, you need to essentially make a decision and say this decision is wrong or right. But you can't just say a decision is wrong or right, just like I can't say Fumi is a good or bad person. I have to have a standard to review it by. So those standards are what we call the standards of review. And I tried providing a bit of a historical perspective to the standards of review that historically we used to have three, and then it became two, and then it became three again. Now, these standards of review themselves, they exist, but you can't just pick one that you like. You still need a roadmap to identify which one should apply for the different scenario. So this roadmap is what we call the standard selection system. And I gave you a bit of a history that we used to have the pragmatic and functional factors as the roadmap, which then became the default assumption and became convoluted with both. And then Vavilov clarified and said, OK, let us start following this roadmap that I have on the screen, which we call the presumption of reasonableness. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, definitely. OK, yeah. so okay. when we say does the statute provide for a standard, we're essentially saying does the enabling statute that established the decision maker codify a particular standard that should be applicable to that decision maker. If it does, that is your standard of review. But then if it doesn't, you continue your analysis to try and identify the right standard, which is what we are doing right now. So in continuing our analysis, we then ask, does the statute provide for a right of appeal? If it does, then you now need to ask yourself a couple of questions. What is the nature of the question in issue? Is it a question of law? Is it a question of fact? Is it a question of mixed fact and law? If it's a question of law, then correctness is your standard. If it's a que question of mixed, or oh, sorry, if, it, if it's a question of fact or question of mixed fact and law, then your standard is palpable and overriding error. If the statute doesn't provide for a right of appeal, then you still need to continue your analysis. But before we continue the analysis, the question that should be burning at the back of your mind right now is, how do I know when it's a question of law or when it's a question of facts? or when it's a question of mixed fact and law. How do I know that? OK, so let's do a quick analysis of that before we continue the selection standard analysis. So questions of law and questions of facts. Um, this is a very good example. Questions of fact are questions that are specific only to the case at hand. And on the other hand, questions of law are questions on how a law should be applied not just to the case at hand, but generally speaking. And I'll give you guys an exercise shortly, so please pay attention. For example, let's say Joe got fired because he was caught drinking alcohol on his lunch break. But then Joe sues for wrongful termination, claiming that he's an alcoholic. 
and that there are laws protecting him from being fired because he considers his alcohol addiction a medical condition. That's the fact pattern. There are two questions in that. The first is to decide whether or not his drinking was a result of alcoholism, which is a medical condition. That would be a question of fact because it's only specific to this case. Not everybody would have a medical condition and be drinking because of that. Now, whether he's an alcoholic, whether or not he's an alcoholic, we have nothing to do with any other person's case, right? But then the second one is if he was drinking because of alcoholism and whether a law protects him, that is whether there's a law that protects alcoholics, if that's the right word, or what? No, I don't know. Whether the law protects anyone that has alcoholism, then that is a general question of how a law should apply to any party that is also saying that, well, my drinking is because of alcoholism. And any other party with the same scenario asking for the same protection, that would be a question of law. So essentially, a question of law is generally applicable to everybody. A question of fact is going to be personal to that person that won't be applicable to the next person that comes before the court. So let's do a quick exercise. But before we do it, so now if, if you come to the conclusion that your question is a matter of law, correctness is the standard. If you come to the conclusion that it's a question of mixed fact and law, palpable and overriding error is the standard. So the quick exercise is on your screen. I have this sample exam question. Now we want to determine the nature of the issue in question here. We want to determine the nature of the issue in question by determining whether it's a question of law, a question of fact, or a question of mixed fact and law. Where do we start from? This is your exam question. You're in the exam right now. Where do you start from? What, what, where will you consider, what part of your exam question would you consider before you, um, to review the nature of the issue in question? Anybody? UG. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, Ibrahim wants to talk. Go on. Yeah, the first thing to decide would be that does it provide to a standard uh, to determine? Uh, if yes, then uh, no, it's no, no, over. no. What I mean is, what I mean is, yeah, we are past this stage right now. We have decided that there is no standard, and we are here trying to determine if there's a right of appeal. That is, does the yeah, statute right. have a right of appeal in the enabling statutes? Now, we have decided that, yes, there's a right of appeal in the statutes, but we want to determine the nature of the question in issue in this sample exam question. Where do we start from? What do we do? How do we determine the nature of the question in issue in this sample exam question? The first thing would be to determine the facts. Okay. Uh, to determine the facts, to identify them. Then after uh, identifying the facts, uh, we would see if there's any applicable law to that fact or not. Mm. Then according to. Go on. According to our conclusions, we would decide based on that uh, uh, scheme of thoughts, uh, according to that table, that uh, if we have a right to appeal or not. Mm. Uh, but, but the first thing to identify, I think it's the facts. And, uh, and so, so the question, the nature of the question in issue, we want to know, essentially, we want to know whether it's a question of law that's been decided or a question of facts or a question of mixed fact and law. Those are the three things we want to determine. Which of, which, which of the three is it going to be? And where do we start from in this question to identify that? Olusha, you, you don't agree? You want to say something? No, 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 I agree, yeah. Um, sorry, um, my take would be that um, when you finish identifying the facts, um, then um, the issues that have been brought up from the facts will be analyzed to actually see if its concerns is related to the law or if it's just about facts alone or mixed law and facts or something. Mm. So, where, so where, would you, where would you start from in the exam question? Because you can't review the entire exam question for the nature of the issue in question. You have to start your time management because I probably forgot to mention this. 40% of what you need to pass admin law is time management because you will never finish the exams. I didn't finish mine and you won't finish yours, I can guarantee you. If you finished, you didn't do it well. So you need to start your time management from now, even before you start your studies. So you can't go through the entire exam question to determine it. If you go through it, you've wasted time. 
So what part of the exam question is relevant for determining the nature of the issue in question? Um, well, I, um, okay. okay. I to go. okay. Yes, um, I, I would assume that um, you go through the question itself. You look at the question and ask what um, you see. But, what but that's the entire question. If you go through the entire no, no. question, that's like question, 30 minutes. The question itself. What question is the question, it's question itself? No, you know the facts are presented and then there's a place for question. So I, I suppose that the question just be below Okay. Where, uh, where they are asked um, a specific question. Maybe mm -hmm. that will give a, a hint as to what, whether it's a, an issue of law or facts of mixed law and facts. That, that's what I think. Any other, any other opinion or thoughts? Do we have to check it from like the actual decision from the exam question or? I don't know, just talk about it. Mm. You're, you're on track, but let me not talk. Let me not say anything yet. Any other thoughts? Any other? What do you think? Um, okay. Any other? What do you think? Oh, okay. Sorry, I was a little bit away from my phone. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Okay, we'll come back to you. Edna, what are your thoughts? I'm not sure, but I would first start by, um, I wanted to talk about probably uh, the aspect of religion and also the- No, 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 no. I, I, I don't want you guys to assume this is not your question. Maybe I should no. take this from your screen. If you want to determine you have, in your selection standards, selection system, you have gotten to the part where you ask yourself whether there's a right of appeal in the statute and you answer that yes, there's a right of appeal. And you know that the next step is for you to now determine the nature of the issue in question. That is to ask yourself whether it's a question of law or a question of fact or a question of mixed fact and law. If you want to save time, you have 15 minutes left to go. You've wasted three, two hours, 45 minutes on procedural fairness and reading the question. You have 15 minutes left to go and you want to quickly determine the standard. What sure fire part of the exam question should you go to first? Should I answer or attempt to answer? Rhoda, go ahead. Yes, it could be the opening or the closing paragraph of the question with the, the facts and the details there. Close, you're also close to. Oh dear, okay. Any other person? Can I, can I answer? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'll just um, quickly um, apply um whatever rules it is to the issues that I can quickly identify. I said I I was oh sorry for me you wanted to say something I was I was gonna put you guys out of your miseries but it's okay for me go ahead. I think you should examine the decision of the admin agency. Correct the decision. Why? Because whenever you are reviewing Whenever you go on judicial review to the courts after the decision maker has made their decision, what are you reviewing? What are you reviewing? The decision. When my visa application was denied, what was I reviewing? The decision. The decision is what is always up for review. And the decision is where the issue is. So the nature of the issue in question will be easily extracted by scrolling to the decision. And in this instance, this is the decision of this decision maker. OK, so now quick test. Go through this decision and tell me what is the nature of the issue in question. And by the way, I'm going to ask everybody. So I hope everyone is in front of their computers. What is the nature of the issue in question in this decision? Is this a question of law? Is this a question of fact or a question of mixed fact and law? <laughs> 
Okay, we have uh, we have an early answer. Fumi wants to go first. Let's have you, Fumi. Yeah, I think the first paragraph is mm -hmm. a question of law. Okay. Because, yeah, because the commission is saying that the law does not apply to him. He's not eligible. He does not have a right of appeal. Or because he's not a parent's resident and he's also not a citizen. So it does not apply to him. They don't have jurisdiction over his issue. That's what I think. And I didn't think the second one, to talk about them adopting the reasons outlined by the investigator in our report is a question of fact that applies to his case particularly. So in summary, is it a question of law or a question of fact or mixed fact and law? Yeah, it's a mixed question of fact and law. Mixed. This is a mixed? Okay. Uh, um, Adela, what do you think? Uh, I I believe the same. It's a mixed. Mixed, okay. Yes. You know that that reminds me of. Okay, let me not share that story here because of time. Um, Edna. Uh, I believe it is um, a question of law. Question of law. Mm, okay, that's a new entry. So why why do you think it's a question of law? Well, my judgment is basically um, because of the section 45A where it talks about not being eligible to be in Canada. Yeah. Okay, Ibrahim, you have your hands up. Yes, uh, I think it's a question of law because um, they're not going into the issue that is being uh, appealed about. They are not even determining what happened there, like a uh, discriminatory practices. They're just apply. Uh, they're they're approaching the issue initially that we shouldn't even see this case because it's not the, the law is not applicable here because this person is not subject to law that is being questioned. Hmm, amazing. Um, Eniola, thoughts. So um, I think it's a question of law. Okay because um, they are looking into uh, the provision of um, section 45A and they, are, they, they judgment simply applied that section. So I don't, I don't see, from what is here, I don't see any fact that you in quote in this field. That, that's what I think. So I think it's a question of law. Yeah, question of law. I'm waiting for someone to say question of fact so they will explain why. For me. Oh, sorry, Fumi spoke already. Ibrahim spoke to um, Mustafa. Yes, um, I actually believe it's a question of law, because basically what the decision is just about is asking uh, the section 40 sub 5, and that is when I actually believe it's a question of law and not mixed law and fact. Thank you. Okay. Um, Yuri, please, is that correct? Yeah, so okay. I, act, I actually also think it's a question of law because it deals with the interpretation of, um, they're trying to interpret section 40 sub 5a of the act, so I think that is law. Okay, okay, all right. Um, in a case. Oh, sorry, I had a problem taking off the mute. Um, the highlighted sections, it definitely does look like law or an issue in relation to law. The second paragraph though, when they said that they would have refused as a result of the report of the investigator, I can't recall what was in her report to know if it added or made it an issue of fact, but I know definitely the highlighted section sounds like it's an issue of law. Yeah, that's that's a that, that's a very good catch, and I'm going to refer. I'm going to mention that. Actually, I don't even I don't usually review questions in introductory classes. I I reserve that for like the intensive classes because we do review questions in every class. But I just wanted to use that to explain the concept of questions of law versus question of fact. And I'm going to talk about that. What what you mentioned, I'm going to talk about it shortly. Um, Olusha, so thoughts. Uh, my thoughts are um, actually with others as to, as to a question of law 
and not of facts or mixed facts and law. Okay, amazing. Oma? Oma A. Rhoda, thoughts? Okay, I'm going back and forth with myself here. I thought it was a question of fact, um, just because they dismissed it initially, but then I'm hearing everybody <laughs> saying that they did um, use the statute as well, so now it sounds like it's a question of loss. So I'm not too, too sure. I'm in the middle. <laughs> Which okay. to go? Let me quickly, uh, because of time, I don't think I should call everybody else. Well, lucky you, if I haven't called you. Um, so because of time, if you said it's a question of fact, you are wrong. If you said it's a question of mixed fact and law, you are wrong. <laughs> if you said it's a question of law, you're right. Okay, and you just won $5 million. I'm just kidding. Uh, you, you only won like passing your NCA exams. All right, so it's a question of law. And for people that said it's a question of mixed fact and law, I also respect I respect that because there's a bit of a confusion, you know, yeah. But but then the NCA didn't mean the confusion because there's no statutory right of appeal. This was not meant to come into this question at all. This is supposed to be like a reasonableness standard of review or something. So I'm just trying to adapt it to it. Uh, it's a question of law because obviously Section 45A of the Act was being applied. That's why it's a question of law. That's been applied right here, saying, well, based on Section 45A, we can't entertain this matter because Section 45A says you must be in Canada before we can entertain any issues on discrimination. What followed is not an issue of fact, but a mere explanation of the reason why they are not applying Section 45A. They are saying, well, the reason why we are saying that you don't qualify under Section 45A because you're not in Canada is because, number one, you are not a temporary resident, you're not a PR, and you're not a citizen, and therefore you don't qualify under Section 45A. It's still an explanation of the previous paragraph. Now, this other paragraph that NK mentioned is they now said if we had proceeded with this complaint, which means we are not already proceeding at this point. So this part is more like um, in in litigation parlance, you know, there's something called um, when you make an aside, what was it again? Is it pinecorium? Is that what they call it? When you make an aside, something is not the reason for the decision. There are reasons for the decision, which is the ratio, right? And then there is something that is just, uh, what is it? Can anyone remember? Sorry? Um, I Sorry? Maybe, is it obita? I don't know. But anything that is not necessarily related to the reasons for the decision. I think it's an obita. I don't know. But so this is almost similar to that. So they are saying at this stage, we are not proceeding. But even if we are decided to, we would have refused it based on what the investigator mentioned in our report. Now, so let's assume this was included in this, and this is this is not coming as an afterthought. What was in the investigator's report? She said, oh, I was skeptical of this complaint before I started, blah, 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 blah. This guy must be presumed to be dishonest because he's a criminal. Everything the investigator said in our report was personal to the applicant it will not apply to the next person that comes before them. And the meaning of that simply, that simply means that if that is personal to the applicants, it essentially means that the applicant won't, uh, sorry, it essentially means that that would have been a question of fact because it has to do with specific circumstances of the applicants, right? And if the two had been present in the decision, then automatically it would have been a question of mixed fact and law. But fortunately, this is not part of the decision. It's more like a more like an afterthought. And the decision itself only references section 45A and offers an explanation for why the applicant doesn't qualify under section 45A. Does that make any sense? All right. So because of time, I won't, I won't have a lot of time to unpack that. 
Another thing we, so if that doesn't apply, then you can ask yourself if the question, if the matter, if it's a constitutional issue, what are constitutional questions? There's a whole lot of jurisprudence on issues that should be constitutional questions and shouldn't be. We won't have time to un unpack that, unfortunately. And under this constitutional question, there's an attendance issue of Dore versus Barreau de Quebec, which is more like, uh, you know, in paragraph 50, 51 or 57 of Vavilov now, majority paid little attention to the issue of Dore and Dore continues to apply. Dore is a 2012 decision. And guess what? It continues to apply even in the face of Vavilov that's a 2019 decision. And the implication of that is you need to be able to understand when Dory applies and when Vavilov is going to apply. Essentially, Dory applies for charter related issues. And as you will see subsequently, you know, there are two school of thoughts, or let me not say two divisions based on paragraph 51 of Vavilov. And the, you know, the court will tell you, oh, was it the discretionary decision of the ADM that affected the charter rights? If that is the case, Dore applies. Was it the enabling statute that affected the charter rights? If that is the case, Vavilov applies. Now, that's a simple summary. There's a whole lot for us to unpack. In fact, we will need to read Vavilov itself for us to understand, because this is more like a quick summary or quick solution to the though to the question I just asked you. So now you also have to consider the issue of Dory when you're cons considering constitutional questions. And also, is it a question of central importance to the legal system? Now, prior to Vavilov, under Donsmia, we used to have, this factor used to be, is it a question of central importance to the legal system and outside the area of expertise of the decision maker? But guess what? When Vavilov was decided, they removed expertise as an issue. Expertise was removed. And the question now is, what is the implication of removing expertise as an issue in this rebuttal? So questions of central importance to the legal system, again, this is not something that you will determine yourself and say, oh, I think this is, a, this is of importance to the legal system. It doesn't work that way. It's based on past decisions. For example, um, examples of questions of central importance to the legal system. Let me see if I can quickly pull that up, uh, even though I, I won't be able to go into it, but I can maybe pull some things up on that. Uh, so a very good example of a question of central importance to the legal system includes where administrative proceedings will be barred by doctrines of res judicata and abuse of process, the scope of the state's duty of religious neutrality, and the appropriateness of limits on solicitor client privilege, and the scope of parliamentary privilege. Now, these are all from specific cases. And if you read the case of Vavilov, you'll be able to see them. So these were not made up. So it's not the case that you say, oh, I think this is a matter of central importance to the legal system. No, doesn't work that way. And going back to what I was saying earlier, ex expertise was removed as part of this factor. And a question of central importance to the legal system and outside the area of expertise of the decision maker basically means, number one filter is, is it of central importance? The second filter is now saying, but is it within the expertise of the decision maker? Because if it's within their expertise, then you should still leave it outside of the correctness ambit. Because all these guys in, um, is it pink now? What do they call it? Orange. All of them will attract a correctness standard. And if the matter is within the expertise of a decision maker, you should not adjudicate it based on a correctness standard. Let me, let me try and explain that. Everybody here is familiar with um, cryptocurrency, right? Bitcoin, the decentralized finance ecosystem, proof of stake, proof of work, everything. Initial coin offering, anything, crypto system, whatever. Now, so let's assume they set up a decision maker to adjudicate cryptocurrency issues, like the IROC, which used to be a securities decision maker. If the IROC now makes a decision on maybe a cryptocurrency fraud that was committed on the blockchain and the review is now being made to the court, I can assure you that there's a chance that those judges don't know anything about cryptocurrency, which means that issue is within the expertise of that decision maker. Now, the implication of that removal was done now means that any matter, whether or not it's within the expertise of the decision maker, 
goes for review now on a correctness standard as long as it's of central importance to the legal system. Whereas if the expertise issue was still there, it won't fall under correctness standard, it will be on reasonableness standard. And in case you don't know by now, reasonableness is a differential standard. I, I'm, I'm going to get there time permitting. Reasonableness is a differential standard while correctness is not. So the next one is to ask whether it's a jurisdiction question between two or more decision makers. And the most recently added one, which was added last year, is to ask if it's a concurrent first instance jurisdiction between a court and an ADM. In addition, what was also added last year to the syllabus was the issue of using artificial intelligence to make decisions. I did a quick video on that. I would encourage you to check out our YouTube page or Instagram, follow NCA guides on our platform, Instagram, Facebook, wherever. I did a quick video on that. You know, what, what, does, what, what is the position of the courts on using artificial intelligence to make decisions? Now, anyone that falls within all these orange boxes will be adjudicated on a correctness standard. If you are unable to rebut the presumption, then reasonableness stands. Remember, we started with the presumption of reasonableness. I think we have someone in our midst that doesn't have a name. Uh, the person's name is Guest. Do you mind introducing yourself quickly, Guest? Yeah, my name is Nkaiso, and... Um... My sorry students. my name is Nkaiso. oh okay yeah sorry i just saw guests so i wasn't sure who the person was all right yeah welcome okay. to the class um so finally um yeah i talked about the dory one i'm just going to skip that it's going to waste a lot of our time uh so now the final thing to talk about is now that you've identified your standard to be either reasonableness, correctness, or palpable and overriding error, then the next thing you need to do now is to apply that standard. So in terms of your exam questions, procedural fairness is probably half of the marks obtainable. Identifying the standard is probably another 10%. Now, applying the standard will carry 40%. Now, the process of applying the standard we differ based on the different standards of review. There is the reasonableness standard of review. There is the, yeah, so there are two reasonableness. There's the reasonableness according to Vavilov. There's the reasonableness according to the Dore Loyola case, which I mentioned. There is the uh, correctness. And then there is palpable and overriding error. Reasonableness, like I mentioned, is a differential standard. It deals with the intelligibility in the decision-making process and whether a decision will fall within the range of acceptable outcome. That is the way Donsmeyer defines reasonableness. But Vavilov will also tell you that reasonableness has to do with... Um, Vavilov will tell you that uh, where reasonableness applies, you want to look at certain things. For example, a reasonable decision must be internally coherent. It must present a rational chain of analysis. It must be justified in relation to the fact, and it must be justified in relation to the relevant law. Now, for you to conduct a reasonableness analysis, you need to start from the reasons. But what if reasons are not provided? And if you look at Vavilov, Vavilov gives us different situations and how to undo them depending on whether reasons have been provided. That is situation one, you have reasons required but are not provided. Then you, you now need to start asking yourself, okay, when are reasons required? That's another board game entirely. Because there are instances when reasons are not required, but if reasons are required but not provided, then the matter fails. But if reasons are not required and not provided, there's nothing you can, you can do about that. You need to now look, the court is now telling us that you need to look at the underlying process, you know, look at, you know, record the record as a whole to understand the decision. And in doing so, you will often uncover a clear rationale for the decision. But what if reasons are not required, they are not provided, the record and larger context does not provide for the basis of the decision, you will still need to look at the relevant legal and factual constraints on the decision maker before you conclude that it's not reasonable. And once you do that, you now try to conduct a reasonableness analysis and ask yourself, does this decision follow a rational chain of analysis? Can we say this decision is internally coherent? Can we say it's justified in relation to the fact or the law? So when we talk about a rational chain of analysis, as a quick example, if we go back to this sample exam question, they are saying, oh, this man is not in Canada because, uh, sorry, we're not going to listen to this guy because he's not lawfully present in Canada. So what does lawfully present in Canada mean? 
What does it mean to be lawfully present in Canada? It means you are present in Canada because an authority like the IRC said has been saddled with granting your test to Canada said you can come into Canada. So the question is, is this man lawfully present in Canada? You will need to determine that by looking at the fact, how did he come into Canada in the first place? Guess what? He was brought into Canada because they extradited him. So did he escape into Canada without the permission of the authorities? I will leave that for you to ponder on. Uh, then after you've done that, you then ask yourself, can you justify this in relation to the facts? Can you justify this in relation to the law? Then that will now help you to inform your analysis, to inform analysis of whether the decision is reasonable or not. And because reasonableness review or standard is a differential standard, the courts will try and dance, dance around and consider the reason or reasoning process of the decision maker. And even when they make their decision, they will still send it back for reconsideration to the admin body. But correctness on the other hand is different because when it comes to correctness standard and the instances where correctness standard applies, number one, where the question before the court is that of law and there's a right of appeal in the statute or where the enabling statute says correctness standard should apply or where you're reviewing constitutional questions or questions of central importance to the system or questions of jurisdiction boundaries, boundaries between two or more ADMs or issue under review is a question relating to the concurrent first instance jurisdiction between an ADM and a court. That is when, or those are the instances where correctness as a standard will apply. And for a correctness standard analysis, the courts don't care about your reasoning process. They don't care about your reasons. They don't require re your reasons. The court will undergo its own reasoning. And which is why you don't, most, most decision makers don't want the court to review their standard on, uh, the, to review their decision on the standard of review of correctness because it's a much ash or asher review, if I can say that. And another thing that happens is that the court doesn't return the matter back to the ADM for reconsideration. The court makes a decision and the matter ends there. It's like an appeal. They don't say, oh, oh, oh go back. They, it ends there. Now, of course, you need to consider the correctness analysis. I won't have time to go into that, unfortunately. Then the next one is the palpable and overriding error standard. Now, palpable and overriding error means, palpable means plain to see. Overriding means goes to the root of the decision. So for this standard, the court is essentially saying, we will not interfere in this decision making. Oh, sorry, we will not interfere with this decision, except you can tell us that there's an error that is plain to see and goes to the root of the decision, which means if the error is palpable but is not overriding, we will still not interfere. It must be both palpable and overriding. So, if, for example, I say, uh, I can see Fumi is Netflixing and chilling right now. That is an error. Why? Because a palpable error is an error that is plain to see or an error that is accept. Or if, for example, if you accept an evidence contrary to what everybody can see. So I just accepted an evidence that Fumi is Netflix, Netflixing and chilling right now. When we can all see uh, that he's right in front of the camera. But then the question is, if I say, well, Fumi, because you're Netflixing and chilling, I am sending you out of this class. So as my error led or has my error gone to the root of my decision? Yes, because the reason for booting her out of the class is because I believe she was Netflixing and chilling. But if I say, oh, for me, it's Netflix, Netflixing and chilling, it's okay. I'm not going to do anything. Then it means I made an error, but it hasn't gone to the root of anything, right? So you have to ask yourself, the error must be plain to see and overriding. And then finally, the reasonableness, according to Dore, that's a much complicated one because here you are not going to be con, con, you're not you're not going to be considering the intelligibility in the decision making process and whether it falls within the range of acceptable outcomes or whether it's interna internally coherent or follows a rational chain of analysis justified in relation to the fact or law. You're not doing that for this second type of reasonableness review. This is similar to this. The analysis you conduct for constitutional law students, there's an, ana there's an analysis you conduct for section one, R versus Oaks, Oaks test. You know, remember when there's a charter infringement, you now ask yourself, 
can it be saved by section one in constitutional law? This is similar to that, but we don't call it section one Oaks test. We call it the proportionality analysis. And in this analysis, what you're trying to do is you want to determine whether the law has affected the charter rights and you want to ensure it doesn't affect it more than it should necessarily have to. And in doing that, you need to consider the minimal impairment analysis, proportionality analysis, substantial objective, and what's the fourth one? Rational connection. Similar to section one Oaks, Oaks approach, but a bit different. And you will see, if you read the cases of Dore and Loyola, ETR meeting, Law Society of BC and TWU, and you read the, uh, uh, the, the position of Justice Beverly McLachlan, in you know, Trinity Western, even though it was a dissenting opinion, but it will help you understand this better. And there are several other things that you need to consider under that, which I can't go into right now. Then finally, remedies. You have done, completed your substantive review analysis, procedural fairness analysis. What are the remedies available? Now we have prerogative rates. We've got private law remedies. Everything you see on the right here, Mostly, you can't get that in an admin proceeding. You probably have to start a separate suit. But for admin proceedings, these are most likely the remedies that are relevant. The surari, which essentially means to quash or set aside a decision. Almost every decision you're quashing or setting aside will require a surari remedy. Then we've got the prohibition to order a tribunal not to proceed. If, for example, you run to the court because you think there's bias already ongoing and you want to stop it in, a track, in its tracks, prohibition is a very relevant um. Remedy, mandamus is to order the performance of a public duty, specific performance of something. Declaration is just to state a legal position. It doesn't really change much. Abuse couples usually saying produce the body. Rich challenges detention of citizens. Quo Waranto challenges the authority to just to make a decision. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have been able to ignite the fire to want to go and study in you after these few points of mine. It's been three hours of talking. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, so for anyone interested in joining the intensive classes, registration for the intensive classes will also guarantee you a spot in the exam workshop. So the intensive classes are for discussing the contents, almost similar to what we did today, but on a more granular level, because we're going to now start drilling into the topic one after the other. We didn't talk a lot about case laws today because it was going to slow us down. So there's a whole lot of case law jurisprudence that we need to examine. There will be assignments and grading the assignments because one thing I realized when I was studying for my own exams was that it is one thing to actually understand the contents. It's another thing to know how you will write it down for the exam because you can know everything and you will still fail, you know. So which is where the assignment and I I think most of my previous candidates, what they always tell me is that until they started writing the assignments, they did not know that they didn't know it. You know, they thought they knew it based on, you know, when you talk. It's when you start writing it down that you start really realizing that you don't. So that's what the main intensive classes will be for. But then the exam workshop is not for content. The exam workshop is to... So for the exam workshop, it's a six hours workshop. For, and what we do in the workshop is that we simulate actual exam conditions. We are going to sit and write an exam for three hours. And when we are done, we will then answer the exam question. Of course, you take a 30 minute break. We will then answer the exam question and then you will judge yourself whether you are ready to proceed. More often than not, 95% are always ready to proceed. There will be that one or two people that will be like, I don't think I want to waste my money and I want to postpone, but at least it's better than failing. But we do have a very good record in this classes specifically. I will encourage anyone that is interested to register right away. Classes start next week, Saturday, secure your spots. If you decide not to register uh, and you are just interested in purchasing materials, just go to our website, the study materials, you see all the materials. The materials I was using to teach today is the admin law framework is all there, notes are all there. And I wish you the best in your exams if I don't ever see you again. <laughs>